Hello. Welcome to the Center for Virgin Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and our inaugural Nasser and Akhavan Symposium on Iranian Religions. Uh, let me just uh, make a statement and then uh, begin the uh, conference after uh, my colleague and co convener uh, Matthew uh, gives a much more meaningful, I think, uh, introduction. Uh, more than a century ago, uh, Franz Coulon's magisterial work on the mysteries of Mitra was published, 1894 1899. Uh, I should say that uh, Coulon's idea that the Zoroastrian Magi's cult shaped the cult of Mitras had consequences which went beyond um, the West's discourse um, and uh, about the meaning of the cult of Mitras. While in the West, the ideas of Kuman's groundbreaking work has been uh, criticized or thoroughly vetted, in Iran, uh, in, the 19th, in the 1970s conference of Mitra, um, and the translation of Kuman's work into Persian, it has brought a strong sense of affinity between the cult of Mithras and Rome, and what is called is part of Mithraism in the Iranian world. Um, this is something that is of course important to me as a Persian speaker, as an Iranian, and I think uh, since 1970s I spoke with uh, Professor German, there has not been a conference again on Mitras, uh, Miro, however you want to define it, and uh, I think it's quite nice that we have the opportunity to uh, perhaps revisit the issue of Roman Mithraism, uh, the Indo-Iranian uh, Mitra, and what is in between, I think, the Pontus, Caucasus, and Syria as this other important, I think, uh, place of interaction and exchange. Uh, so it is, uh, I'm really glad, and I would like to thank, again, Nasarana and Havon uh, for allowing us to come together and begin this discussion of uh, a deity that is an Afro-Eurasian deity in some ways, if you want to look at it as such, and see the connections and the disconnections and whatnot. So, please. Thank you all uh, for coming here, and of course, thank you especially to Nasran. Uh, just a little <clears throat> anecdotes about the genesis of this conference. It actually started, the idea of it uh, started in, I think, uh, winter, uh, December of 2019, when I posted the Safet uh, mural from the Bamiyan uh, Buddha, and Nasran saw it and came up with the idea that there really hasn't been any discussion about it for many, many years, and suggested the idea that we hold uh, a conference here at the Jordan Center. So this, uh, thankfully with her support, is uh, turning into a series of three conferences, one on Mithra, uh, the next on Mani, Manichaeism, and then uh, the final one on Mazdaq. Uh, so we're very happy uh, to begin with this very important topic. So just a, a few more words on top of what uh, Tubraj said. Um, of course, very happy to welcome you to this conference convened by myself and Turaj Dariyi. 
So our goal has been to organize the first comprehensive scholarly meeting on the deity since the celebrated conference held in Tehran in 1975. So our goal here is not to search for similarities or common origins of the various religions that incorporate uh, Mithra, Mithras, uh, Nero, Mir, and so on. Rather, we hope that this event will foster new scholarship on Mithra from a broader Afro-Eurasian perspective. So this conference brings together a group of scholars to explore this problem from a range of disciplinary and regional perspectives, from Iran to Central Asia to South Asia and East Asia, as well as the Mediterranean. And I'm pleased to say that we have an important contingent of scholars who will re-examine the problem of Roman Mithraism within the context of the broader Roman religious ecosystem. So here, over the course of uh, today, will no doubt revisit several problems inherited from previous generations, but seek to shift the topic of conversation away from origins or purity to approaching the deity as a broader Eurasian religious phenomenon that impacted and at times mediated between multiple religious and political cultures. Um, moreover, I'm happy to say from my own perspective that the conference also emphasizes archeological evidence and questions, which is in many cases our only uh, fixed point for these problems and uh, primary source evidence. So to set the stage and think about more what we know, uh, what we might not just call Mithra, but rather the Mithra phenomenon, um, I, hope, I hope to offer just a few brief thoughts on ways forward in understanding this broader afro region problem. And I'll speak more about this in my conclusions as I listen and integrate contributions. But I just want to begin by framing what we're looking at by saying that there's few few gods that appear over such a wide temporal and geographical expanse in antiquity. Uh, the god Mithra was popular from the Atlantic uh, to Central Asia. Uh, and I use this word popular instead of necessarily worshipped since it seems that the god was not always at the center of the cult in all periods and all regions. It is in the Iranian cultural sphere that we find the god's greatest popularity through multiple periods, with attestations from the end of the first millennium BC through the antiquity. Although not the supreme deity of Zoroastrianism, the Iranian god, Zata, the best in Pithra, stands out as enjoying superlative popularity, not only across the Iranian world, but many other regions. The god appears in Vedic Sanskrit as Mitra and Mitra in the Avesta. That is the oldest collection of texts in the Iranian language, sharing a common Indo-Iranian heritage as a deity of contract, treaty, and agreement. Within the variety of early Iranian religious traditions that later developed <coughs> as rationalism, he is all seen and protects all creatures, but swiftly and piteously punishes all those who violate the moral foundations of society or abuse station of power. One of his Avestan epithets is Mithra, Lord of All Lands, which has served as an evocative title for our symposium. He's associated with fire and with the radiance of the sun in Vesta, in a later tradition, is visually and discursively portrayed as a god of light and the sun. And this assimilation uh, first appears uh, overtly in Strabo, suggesting that this coalesce perhaps even after the fall of the Achaemenid dynasty. Though often repeated, Babar's conjecture that Mithra was the focus of the state religion of the Medes is unsupported by any evidence, not to mention the fact that the so-called Median Empire has similarly been proven to, uh, to lack the uh, foundations of the empire. So Mithra is mentioned in later Old Persian inscriptions, which are our first solid archaeologically datable attestation, but the god is not portrayed visually in the Achaemenid period. Indeed, the god is especially prevalent in the post achaemenid Iranian regions of the Caucasus and Anatolia, including Komagene, but especially Armenia as well, which combined with fragmentary evidence suggests that Mithra was prominent in Parthian Zoroastrianism. Nevertheless, the evidence of the god in the Arsacid Empire is extremely scant. Only after Alexander the Great does Mithra develop a recognizable iconography in Perso-Iranian visual cultures and in his archaeological record. And here, this is when we begin to have some of, from my perspective, uh, 
more reliable uh, primary source evidence. Uh, so, of course, the other uh, major phenomenon here is the phenomenon of omen uh, myth raising. So this is one of the central problems that uh, we'll deal with in our conference, and it has, as it has for earlier studies. Uh, sometime in the early empire, here we can't speak with any exactitude, the god became the chief feature of one of the more successful non-state religions of the Roman Empire. Roman Mithras shares, shares certain key elements with Iranian Mithra, at least the name, but also certain iconographic correspondences such as the emergence from a rock mountain. However, the Roman cult bears little resemblance to any known Iranian tradition, despite over a century of scholarship, it is attempted to find, uh, to search for this, beginning with Franz Kaman in the 19th century. So as we, have, as we will hear from others who command greater expertise in the topic, there's no consensus on the central myth of the Mith Mithraic cult. And despite decades of study, we scarcely understand the meaning of its central images despite their uh, overwhelming ubiquity across the Mediterranean. So <coughs> I just want to uh, kind of reinforce at this point that we're not uh, looking for a common origin. We're not trying to uh, search for some sort of uh, pure Mithra. Uh, rather, what I hope we're going to uh, investigate today is the broader Afro-Eurasian phenomenon and understand how, uh, how and what Mithra meant to multiple different uh, figures in antiquity. So with that, I'll turn the podium over virtually to our first speaker, uh, actually to our panel chair, who will then turn the podium over to the, the first speaker. <laughs> so. Good morning, everyone. We have Carlo. Uh, he's on. Okay, he's on. Okay. So it's a very special honor and a great pleasure to welcome Professor Ceretti from La Sapienza University in Rome, uh, a leading scholar in Iranian studies, and whom I now also consider my colleague here at UC Irvine. Professor Ceretti's published work covers a wide range of subjects in Iranian studies and a range of different uh, disciplines, including philology, linguistics, epigraphy, history, religion, and archeology. span He has published extensively on texts in Middle Iranian languages, especially Middle Persian, and his monographs on Zoroastrian texts and the Pahlavi literature are landmark publications. His numerous articles and editorial work have uh, paved the way for new scholarship, have literally created a new field. In addition to his academic work, Professor Ceretti has held a range of uh, uh, remarkable offices and senior roles, including Cultural Counselor of M the Embassy of Italy in Tehran and President of the Societa Iranologica Europea, uh, among many others. Uh, since 2006, he is, has been the director of the Italian mission of uh, the Kurdish region of Iraq, leading the archaeological investigation at the site of the Sasaniad monument of Narsi at Paikuli, which has a very important bilingual inscription, something that will be in the future a tremendous resource for the study of early Sasanian history. Today, he will speak to us on Theophoric Mithra names in the Iranian tradition. Let us please welcome Professor Carlo Geretti. Can you hear us? 
Yes, I can hear you, and okay. but I cannot uh, you can share, share my screen. You should allow me to share the screen. How about trying it now? Yes. Yes. Can you see this? Uh, my screen now. Slowly. Can you do it one more time, please? Okay. It tells me that I am sharing my screen. Yes. Ah, we got it. <clears throat> you are ready whenever you are. Okay, so can you hear me and can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you, Andromache, for the generous words that you have spent uh, about myself. Uh, uh, first of all, I wish to thank the organizers, Matt Kaniba and Turaj Dariai, <coughs> those of whom I am uh, linked uh, by a great uh, friendship. And I wish to thank also the entire staff of the Jordan uh, Center. Uh, more than everything, uh, I wish to thank uh, Nastarana Havan for her generous grant. And I will never forget that it was thanks to a similar grant that I visited California, Fullerton at the time for the first time in my life. Uh, I was particularly touched by the uh, intervention of both Turaj and Matt, especially because as you probably all know, the uh, archive of Cumont is held at the Academia Belgica in Rome, and there are ongoing studies on many aspects of his archives. And this conference could well uh, connect to some of these. So what I am going to talk about today is uh, basically a uh, built basically on an old article uh, by Rudiger Schmidt, who uh, studied the uh, old Iranian names uh, in uh, the old Iranian names, uh, the, the names containing uh, old Iranian Mithra uh, over a long period of time that goes more or less from the uh, 7th century BCE to the 4th century of the current era. Uh, now, this article uh, in itself uh, built, uh, I mean, uh, Rudiger Schmidt's article in itself uh, started off from an other ancient article by Cumont, who had published uh, uh, in the early uh, nine, uh, 20th century about uh, 100 and some uh, Mithra names. And on this, uh, on what then uh, Jacques uh, Duchesne Guillemin and yes, uh, Peter Asmussen, Banveniste himself, had uh, also uh, said about the importance of. Uh, Mithra names of Mithraic onomastic in the study of uh, Iranian, at least uh, Mithraism, and more in general on the importance of onomastics in uh, in studying the um, <coughs> the Iranian religions. Uh, this is the uh, reference to Schmidt's uh, article. Of course, I am well aware of the fact that uh, today there are many new works and one should also consider them. Main among these is 
Tavernier's uh, work on Iranic and the Achaemenid period from 2007, but also many volumes from the Iranish Espressone Namen book that is published in Vienna. Now, what did uh, Rudiger Schmidt uh, list in his 1978 article? He found 289 persons <laughs> carrying 35 different Mitra <laughs> names. And these uh, Mitra names were attested, as I said, between the 7th BCE and the 4th century of the current era. Apart from the 35 different Mithra names that could be reconstructed in, all, in old Iranian, uh, Rudiger Schmidt also uh, lists 10 other names uh, that are clearly Mithraic, uh, but that do not, uh, uh, but he was not able, and I'm not able any more than he was, to uh, reconstruct a definite uh, Iranian form for this uh, for these names. Now, what strikes me, uh, and what also always has struck me in reading these uh, papers, in, in reading uh, Rudiger Schmidt's paper, is that uh, when you look into the 35 names, you see that more than 50% of these occurrences, of the occurrences of these, uh, of these uh, 35 names uh, concern only two names. One is Mithradatta, uh, which is of course the most uh, famous of all Mithra names and is the name that was, um, um, that was born by uh, a very high number of uh, kings and sovereigns uh, in, the, uh, in ancient Iranian and Hellenistic times. And the other one uh, attested 69 times is made of uh, these, uh, of a, the short form Mithra that may stand for almost any uh, Mithra names existing. So uh, in fact, more than 50% of the occurrences go back probably to a form Mithra data. Uh, the first 11 names uh, include also these other forms, uh, Mithra Pata, protected from uh, Mithra, Mithraya and Mithrata, two short forms, Mithra Tauchma, that comes, that means coming from the seed of uh, Mithra, from the lineage of Mithra, Mithrada, another, another uh, short form, Mithra Upasta, who has the assistance, help uh, of uh, Mithra, Mithra Vahishta, the best through Mithras, another short form of Mithrina, and finally Mithra Barzana, who elevates uh, Mithra. So you see that, uh, in fact, except for 11 names, the other 24 names are all names that come forth only uh, one time. What is also very interesting in uh, Rudiger Schmidt's analysis is that none of these names find a precise parallel in any known Avestan text. As you know, uh, let's say, Indo-European and uh, Iranian onomastic is an onomastic that speaks, that is names that have a meaning. And some names that have a meaning can in reality somehow um, reflect uh, phrases uh, from um, uh, or syntagmas from Avestan or old uh, uh, Indo-Iranian uh, uh, texts. This is not the case, at least not exactly the case for any of the, of the Mithra names uh, that uh, were studied uh, by uh, Rudiger Schmidt. However, so none had a precise uh, parallel in uh, Avestan or Old Persian that are some Mithra names uh, that sort of go back to uh, possible uh, Avestan or Old Persian figures of speech. Not exact correspondences, 
but possible uh, parallels. So we have Mithra Yasna, Mithra worshipper, that can be uh, led back to one of the many sentences uh, uh, having Mithram in the accusative with uh, some uh, form of the verb or the verbal root yas to worship, so to worship Mithra. At the same time, Mithra Farna, who has Mithra's Farna, whose Farna is from Mithra, can be uh, led back or can be compared to a form uh, coming up in Yast 1016, uh, where we find the four Mithro Quareno Dato, uh, whose Quarna, uh, uh, whose glory comes from, uh, uh, sorry, Mithra, who uh, bestows the Quarna or the uh, glory. Again, Mithra Pata, protected by Mitra can be compared to the form found under Agdaxerxes II, Mitra Mam Patuf, may Mitra protect me, and uh, uh, that is uh, the king. And as you see in the quotations from uh, Rudiger Schmidt article, there are other forms that find a parallel in this, uh, in this text. So, in the end, Rudiger Schmidt's article investigates the older attestations of the name Mithra from the beginning of the Achaemenid period to the early Sasanian Empire in whatever tradition uh, they may appear. As we have seen, attested names are not numerous and mostly refer to a divinity that has the power to fulfill his believers' wishes. At the end of this paper, Schmitz reiterates the importance that he himself attributes to the study of Middle Iranian Mithra names, so not hiding a degree of skepticism about the contribution of honomastics to the knowledge of, of the spread of the cult of Mithra in the Iranian area. In an article that I myself contributed to uh, Adriano Rossi's Feshrift, I put together the attestations of Mithra names in some Middle Iranian traditions. Uh, now, in that article, that article, I wrote that article uh, in the months that immediately preceded uh, my return from Iran. So uh, it is sort of a very arid list of names. Uh, but, and, and now today I wish to reflect a bit more on what these names uh, mean. So the collection and study of Middle Iranian Mithra name is now made possible, albeit limitedly to primary sources, by the remarkable development that in recent decades has experienced the Iranish Personennamen, an imposing work launched by Manfred Meyerhofer. At the time, I did not deal with names specifically begun, belonging to the Manichaean tradition, but this can be uh, now studied more at ease thanks to uh, the recent uh, volume uh, published by uh, Iris Kolditz in 2018, nor did I uh, deal with Buddhist or Christian traditions. Of course, in Manichaean Buddhist and Christian traditions, Mithra names are relatively uh, limited uh, because of a different uh, naming uh, habit. Uh, for the epigraphic Middle Persian, we can rely on the two volumes published by Philip Genu in 1986 and 203. For the Bactrian, for Bactrian uh, we can rely on the work by uh, Nicholas Sims Williams, and for the, let's say, non religious Sogdian tradition, on the important volume uh, published by Pavel Lurie in 2010, uh, all uh, within the Iranische um, Personennamen book. And uh, in this context, Rudiger Schmidt has contributed an important volume on Parthian. And while uh, Ginu and the uh, um, Julien sisters have published a volume dedicated to the Syriac tradition. To all these, we can now add the very recent uh, volume by Martosi. Mart 
Rosian dedicated to Armenian uh, onomastic uh, tradition, of course, uh, including uh, many uh, loan names from um, Iranian, uh, Iranian languages. And these are the references for those of you who may care to read them or do not uh, know them. Uh, so the different traditions investigated in that paper and here today cover a very wide chronological span ranging from, ranging from the first century uh, before the common era to the early part, uh, that is the early Parthian documents of Nisa to the ninth century of the current era for Pahlavi literature. Uh, with the notable exceptions of the Parthian Ostraka of Nisa that had that represent a very a huge um, a huge uh, uh, treasure house for onomastic. By far the most consistent nucleus of names are those from the Sasanian period, with a peak in the late period of this dynasty, which decreases in the early years of Islamic rule. Particularly significant is the contribution of the Middle Persian glyptic of the late Sasanian period which alone has transmitted the majority of the attested Mitra names. As to the geographical distributions of the attestation, attestations, a first analysis shows that these theonyms is more common in Western Iranian language than in Eastern ones. However, this may well depend on a number of different causes, causes including the fact that many Eastern Iranian texts belong to specific religious traditions and that the names attested in um, Sasanian glyptics are particularly numerous. Uh, precisely for these reasons, I have chosen to report names in the form found in inscriptional Middle Persians whenever it be attested. Names that occur only in other traditions are re each presented following the tradition of a specific field of studies. Only the forms that occur in primary sources have been here lemmatized, where the Syriac tradition has been used only for comparative purposes, as will the Armenian one be. I have counted a total of 150 different Mithra names in Middle Iranian tradition, and more may be waiting out there, which means uh, that uh, we have almost five times as many uh, Mithra names attested in these uh, later tradition that what uh, Rudiger Schmidt uh, had to work on when he published his articles. There's also one important methodological problem, uh, and that is uh, when one deals with inscriptional Middle Persian, and I mean especially with uh, names found in glyptics. Uh, a lot of names are shine vanvas. What does that mean? It means apparent copulative, copulative compounds. Uh, joining one, two or more uh, theonyms into one name. Uh, theonyms or in general names. And uh, these may also be understood not as real uh, vanvas, so not as one could understand an old Mithra Baga uh, Mithra and the God, which Mithra was the name of the God by excellence, par excellence, uh, that is um, uh, with, uh, uh, with Varuna, but just as mere, just appositions of names, just as my first name is Carlo Giovanni for no uh, specific reason, I mean, just, just out of chance. We will also see that unfortunately, not all which shines is gold, uh, which is an Italian way of saying uh, that I try to translate into English. So we have, first of all, uh, among these 150 names, uh, a selection that go back to older names. Burzmir, Burzenmir, Mirbadak, Mirban, Mirbandag, Mirmareg, and so on. You can read them on uh, the screen. That can all be uh, understood 
as being uh, determinative or possessive uh, composita as uh, happens normally in the Indo-Iranian and more in general in the Indo-European uh, naming uh, tradition. However, we also have a few names that may be of uh, greater importance in telling us what Mitra, uh, how Mitra was considered in the Middle Iranian, uh, uh, let's say, uh, tradition. So we have names like Mirban, that is having Mithra's splendor uh, that formally, but not at least in my opinion, semantically could also be considered a determinative compound, Mithra splendor, which is attested in Middle Persian uh, glyptics, but it also found in forms like Mirban or Mirbaman in the Bactrian uh, documents. So uh, we see that in this tradition, Mithra is connected with splendor. He is also connected with the sun, as in Mirkhwar, uh, attested in uh, the um, Middle Persian glyptics, but also in Mir. Horshid, Mir a copulative compound uh, built on Mir and Khwarshed. Sorry, I see that the E has, does not have the long mark uh, above it, uh, which is found in the uh, Dadestani Denim. That is a Pahlavi text from the late, uh, from the ninth century. Uh, and in Pahlavi literature, it is not common to have. Uh, um, copulative compounds. So this may be uh, an interesting case, showing that uh, Mithra in the Middle Iranian period was connected with the sun, with splendor, as ha it happens in uh, Rome, but as it is also typical of the older tradition. We also have a number of Mithra names where Mithra is connected with Adur or with uh, uh, Ataksh even. Not only Adurmir and the many compounds that are built on uh, Adurmir, attested uh, in Sasanian glyptics, but also in the uh, Ostraka from South uh, uh, Turkmenistan and in Pahlavi literature, such as the Denkart and the Sandi Vahmaniazd, but also as inverted compound uh, Miradur, as Mir Ataks in the late Rivayati Media Shvaishtan, and uh, as Mir uh, Adur Ma, uh, which attests a triad, Mithra, Fire, and Moon, and even in the very interesting Mir Adur Dad, that can be interpreted of course, as a copulative compound, Mir and then Adurdad, given by the fire, or possibly as a determinative compound, given, created by Adur Mir, almost with an identification of Mithra with the fire. Of course, we all know that Mithra is connected with the fire in the Iranian tradition, and he's also connected with the fire, Agni, in the Vedic tradition. So this may be uh, maybe only a false friend. As you see, uh, this is a list of copulative compounds <laughs> that shows that Mir comes together with a lot of names of deities, names of persons, uh, names of kings, and so, uh, and so on. So this all thing uh, may not be so important. Mithra is also often connected with Farn, with Farna, with the glory, uh, both in the Parthian tradition, Mir, Farn, uh, the same compound is found in the Mount Mook documents in the four Mir Farn. It is found in Sogdian as Mishi Farn, which is a very interesting uh, uh, form. And uh, uh, we have uh, a late uh, a late form uh, uh, of this compound attested as Huara Mithra in uh, Sasanian administrative glyptics. And of course it can be uh, in 
interpreted as a copulative compound, but also, and probably, uh, and maybe more probably, as an inverted form of a compound, mirjuara, that would have the same semantics as the previous uh, two, uh, as the previous two uh, names. So uh, this is um, uh, this is attestation. And what, to my mind, at least what struck me uh, as even more interesting in the uh, at the beginning uh, is the fact uh, that we have uh, two occurrences of Mithra. Uh, let's say both in senior administrative glyptics uh, with uh, uh, an uh, adjective that may uh, uh, hint to uh, his uh, to a color connected uh, to uh, to Mithra. Uh, that is uh, Zarmir. That would be yellow Mitra. Uh, which is attested, as I said, in Sassanian administrative glyptics, uh, so uh, only once, if I remember well. And that could be, uh, as a fact, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, simply be uh, a defective spelling of the following one, so Zal Mitli against Zarren Mitli. Uh, and the second one, uh, Zar Mir, that uh, let's say, uh, would also be a determinative compound, also joining uh, an adjective to uh, a name, and would be probably golden uh, mitra, also attested once in Sassanian administrative glyptics. Why is this interesting? And why would it be interesting uh, joining it together with, um, uh, with the attestations of the name of uh, Mithra linked to the fire, linked uh, uh, to the sun and so on. Of course, uh, because we have in the Hellenistic and then in the Roman tradition, uh, a strong link, so not an identity between Mithras and Sol, Helios and so on. And also because in uh, Mithraic monuments, uh, uh, in Mithraea, uh, from uh, such as the one the important one from Santa Prisca in Rome, but also other ones, uh, Sol and Mithra are depicted as is to be expected in yellow red colors, referring to the uh, nature close to light, close to them, uh, to the sun, and so on. Uh, so. If we consider that this uh, that these uh, names uh, are names uh, uh, dating uh, uh, from as late as the sixth, late fifth, uh, not to, as the sixth and seventh uh, century, probably being attested in Sassanian administrative glyptics, uh, it becomes apparent uh, that. Uh, uh, such an onomastic could also uh, attest uh, to a common, uh, uh, let's say, to a common imaginario, to a common uh, uh, depiction of Mithra between Rome and Iran, which is, does not mean, I mean, it cannot be used to prove uh, an identity between uh, Roman Mithraism and what uh, attested uh, in the late Sassanian Empire or uh, in the late uh, late antique and early medieval uh, Iranian tradition, but it may help, it may uh, show that at least some of the characteristics of Mithra have circulated at the time. Of course, as I said, and I come to the conclusions or near to the conclusions, um, not all what shines is gold. Uh, and in fact, if one uh, goes back, looks back at the Iranian tradition and specifically at the Miryast, you find that already in one of the most uh, famous Kardes of Yasht 10, uh, that all what is uh, found in this onomastics can, only, can also be explained uh, 
uh, through the Iranian tradition alone. Here we read that uh, when grassland magnate Mithra, the tradition is by Ilya Gershevich in his uh, famous edition of the Avestan Hymn to Mithra, uh, which he published in 1959. Here we read that grassland magnate Mithra uh, we worship, who is the first supernatural Menog, spiritual god, to approach across the Hara, the great uh, mountain range of uh, ancient Iranian geography, in front of the immortal swift horse Sun, who is the first to seize the beautiful gold painter, gold painted, and here I underline that the form is Zaranio Piso, so a form that would uh, correspond to the one we find in uh, late Sasanian onomastic, uh, who is the first to seize the beautiful gold painted mountain tops. From there, the most mighty surveys the whole land inhabited by Iranians. And then it goes on with a famous and a noteworthy descriptions of the Iranian lands. So um, what are the conclusion I reach to? Uh, not much. I mean, uh, I think that this paper, in, that in this paper, I've been able to show to some extent that uh, the uh, Mithra onomastics is even more common and more varied in the, uh, in the Sasanian and uh, let's say middle Iranian period, uh, in the extent that uh, middle Iranian period, it is even more uh, common, Mithra names are even more common than what happened in the ancient Iranian period and in the Hellenistic period. Uh, I think that I have been able to show that th some of these names would also fit the imaginario of uh, uh, Roman Mithraism. Uh, but on the other hand, since not all is gold what shines, uh, the same could also be uh, explained from the point of view of uh, the Iranian uh, Zoroastrian tradition. And so probably once again, uh, we should uh, stop looking at this kind of phenomena only from, uh, let's say, a, a genetic or an evolutionary point of view. And uh, let's say, uh, look at them more uh, from the point of view of comparative studies of interplay, interchange of imagines and of dialogue between the different uh, late antique and early medieval religions and uh, societies uh, that uh, would probably be more promising. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope not to have exceeded my time by too much. Thank you, Carlo. This was wonderful. Uh, we have just a few minutes. If uh, we have one question, okay, two questions. So, give a yes, can uh, you come here or just make sure that Carlo can hear you? Yeah. If it's okay. Loud. Loud. Yeah. Loud is good. Yeah. Yes. So what? What uh, the Mitra names uh, can attestations of Mitra names can tell us regarding the differences between? The religious traditions of northern Iranians versus southern, like Medes versus Persians or Parthians versus uh, uh, Persians in old and middle Iranian periods. And one more question. Uh, yes. yeah. Carlo, uh, I want to make sure, did you hear this? Yes, yes, yes. That's what I want to make sure. Yes, go ahead. So, and the other question, if, if you allow me, is that. Uh, so you mentioned, you alluded to the connection between Spire and Mitra. It's, I mean, can you also explain more? Because uh, people have suggested that Mitra has some cosmogenic uh, attributes, which being a social deity may not be true, but it might be true but its connection with it, like for the Indo-Iranian fire deity that could have uh, these uh, attributes. I, uh, I, I has some uh, homogenic uh, phases. Uh, I, I, I missed creation being re related to creation, 
Cosmogenic. Okay. Cosmogenic. Ah, cosmogenic. Cosmogenic. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so, to, as to the first question, uh, what I see uh, looking at names uh, uh, is not so much a difference between north and south. That is not so much a difference between, uh, let's say, Median and Persian names. Uh, and of course, this uh, to some, uh, I thought, of course, the, the most common form of Mithra is the Norse, uh, is the Norsean form. Uh, but this may depend, especially for the Middle I Iranian period, uh, for, for the Middle uh, Iranian texts I'm working with, by the fact that by the late uh, Sasanian period, and, uh, and even more in the early Islamic, uh, in early Islamic times, uh, except for some uh, private inscriptions, uh, uh, we are dealing with, uh, with a koine, uh, that is uh, with a common language, uh, basically uh, based on, uh, uh, on Persian, on Persian with a number of non-Persian, with a very high number of non-Persian loan walls. So that is uh, somehow my feeling. Uh, I, I am not really able to say whether a name in uh, Sasanian glyptics uh, is uh, a Persian, is a name uh, that is born by a Persian or a Median. Uh, or a sorry, or a non-Persian. As for the as to the cosmogenic uh, value of uh, Mithra, of course, a name such as Mithradates, uh, which can be interpreted, of course, as given by Mithra, but also as created by Mithra, would uh, show uh, that Mithra has uh, the capacity to create, not only to donate. And as a matter of fact, in the first version of my um, uh, of my PowerPoint, uh, I had called the uh, section on inherited Middle Iranian names as uh, I, I had put them under the names uh, I had sort of summarized, saying names owned to a creative or creator god. So uh, yes, I think that uh, onomastic especially the most ancient onomastics, co sort of points to the uh, position of Mithra as being uh, a god able to create just as Ahura Mazda was. Then whether this may lead us to the, let's say, Kumontian uh, idea uh, of uh, Mithra being the god of the Magi against Ahura Mazda and so on, this this probably would probably lead us uh, a bit too far, or at least I am not uh, probably the best per person to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Carlos, thank you so very much for this and um, so much to discuss. Uh, I want to advance a rather crazy idea, and please humor me. I was uh, encouraged by your um, idea that we should uh, look across cultures. Um, the, the word Mir obviously occurs in what we etymologize as a short version of Amir in the Islamic uh, so, um, period as a very common, uh, often, um, prefix to various names. But not all of them necessarily make sense. And one of the names that you were mentioning, uh, the Juan um, uh, and Mir Juara, the ones that uh, are um, changing places, very similar things obviously ha happen to the very famous uh, um, family name in the Islamic period, Juan de Mir and Mir Juan, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, which also has some theophoric uh, connections, the, the, the uh, uh, over uh, theophoric as well. Do you think there is a possibility that it is, even in the Islamic period, the similarity with the Arabic uh, was used in order to continue such uh, Mithra-based uh, names? Uh, 
Uh, maybe. I mean, but to say <laughs> whether it can be proved is something else. I mean, we would. Uh, I, I mean, I spent uh, two years uh, in Vienna. Uh, and uh, my professor, uh, I mean, the head of the commission there was Heiner Eichner. And uh, as a linguist, he always told me that he hated onomastics because having no context, uh, uh, you never know whether the meaning you give to a name is true. And I think for Juan Damir and, and similar names, uh, exactly that uh, happens. I mean, of course, yes, we can imagine that someone wanted to play on the Mitra names, but we will never, oh, at least, we are not able to prove it now. I mean. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carlo, for... Um... Uh, a really stimulating uh, presentation and <laughs> okay we are uh, moving uh, ahead our second speaker for this panel is professor dr shervin farid Najat, uh, who holds the professorship of iranian studies at the asia uh, africa institute of the university of hamburg since uh, September 2022. He also leads the MA program Manuscript Cultures, I love this title, at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg. His many publications include, among other books, a book on Zoroastrianism, a quick reference on selective theological and historical issue concepts published in 2016, numerous articles and edited volumes, among which, uh, together with Turaj Tariai, uh, Food for Gods, Food for Mortals, Culinary and Dining Practices in the Greater Iranian World, to mention some that I have consulted myself. So today he will speak to us on Mithra, the Lord of Rituals. Let us please welcome Professor Fatih Kulshad. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I commence with my lecture, I would like to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers um, of this event, especially to Professor Daryai and uh, Professor Kenipa uh, for extending an invitation to me and um, for the hard work and dedication put forth by the organizers in making um, this event possible. Um, my thanks goes also to uh, Mr. Havan and Dr. Arya Mutnat to make this um, event possible. It's an honor to have the opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas with such an estimate uh, audience. I look forward to an engaging and thought-provoking lecture and discussions today. Let's start with some short general remarks about Mithra, to whom the subject of this conference is dedicated. Yes. Scholars generally agree on the meaning of the Indo-Iranian term uh, Mitra, uh, whether used as, uh, as an appellative uh, or as divine proper name that's translated as contract or God contract, and based on its appearance uh, in ancient Indian, ancient and Middle Iranian contexts. Um, Professor Charity has already presented insights about the theomorphic Mitra names in the Iranian tradition from different periods, and there have been scholarly contribution also from the Indology perspective. 
while there may be different opinion regarding the etymology of the Avestan word Mitra and the old Iranian Mitra and the old Indian Mitra, there is a general agreement about its meaning. However, there are differences between the Indian and Iranian accounts of the contract function. In the Vedas, Mitra is depicted as having a somewhat inactive role. And along with Varuna, one of the old and important gods of the Vedic pantheon, associated with the old covering sky, maintains the sacred act or the bow, it's Ratra, um, of the world from a distance. On the other hand, the Avestan Mitra, as we know, is more dynamic heroic and warlike, and thus in the Avesta is accompanied um, by the god Rasravna, the god Victory, always, uh, who, uh, who slays the enemies. In the battle against evil forces, Mithra is supported also by Srausha, the deity of obedience, as well as Rashnu, the god of judgment. Mithra engage in combat, uh, in combat with the evil ones. The Yazata have the responsibility of safeguarding human day and night, and all are aware that they will come face to face with him at the Chinvat bridge and the fourth day following anybody's death. This will now not surprising, not and, and not sound surprising that this encounter takes place in the Havanga, the first watch of the day, which I will come back to it later, which falls under the special jurisdiction of Mitra, as we will see shortly. However, not at all, its better known heroic and warlike aspects are what I want to talk about today, but rather its place and importance for the Zoroastrian rituals. The recent advancements in the study of Zoroastrian rituals over the past two decades have significantly altered our understanding of the ancient Zoroastrian religion. Thus, I think firstly, a short overview and the state of art might be useful for those who are less familiar with the ritualistic discussions within <coughs> studies. The first issue regarding the role of Mithra in the Zoroastrian rituals is connected with his genuine role within the old Zoroastrian pantheon. Zoroastrianism undoubtedly upholds its doctrine through a liturgical system that reflects ancient religious beliefs in of Iran new approach of the study of the complex structure of the Zoroastrian rituals in last two decades, particularly through the work of Kurt Wall and Kremlbrook, Kellens, Cantera and Koenig, has shown how the study of this structure can not only pave the way to understanding the rituals themselves, but also shed light on the past of continuity and changes in Zoroastrian communities. The practice of the ancient fire cult and Halma ceremony still hold a central position within the Zoroastrian rituals. The worship of fire is explicitly mentioned in the Gathas and the Haoma sacrifice. The most important act of Zoroastrian worship is also referred to in them. Zarathustra was born, given that he was a historical person into a conservative religious tradition and worked as a priest himself, is recognized to have presented a, com um, a compelling spiritual and ethical message that was developed within the existing orthodoxy. He raised the stature of Ahura Mazda and emphasized greater moral accountability for individuals. But this new system of religious beliefs, how did the ancient Iranian concept fit it into? And how was the role and place of Mitra? There is no dispute over the fact that Mithra has an important place in Zoroastrianism as it is embodied in the younger Avestan text. There is overwhelming testimony of his own Yasht and Niyayish, together with his frequent invocations in the general liturgy of Yasna, and thus the long liturgies, and the mention of his name in other Yasht. It is also fact that the most other deities, that like most other, uh, other deities, Mitra is not mentioned by name in the Gathas, the oldest text of Zoroastrianism. In her 1969 essay on Mitra's part in Zoroastrianism, Mary Boy's attempt to restore Mitra to his rightful position in the Zoroastrian pantheon. To make a quick summary, uh, most of the Western scholars have held that Zarathustra either denied or tactically ignored 
the existence of Misra or was it strongly opposed to his cult at the beginning of the history of the faith? Our example held that, um, um, that in Zoroaster's vision, Ahura Mazda united the divinities Varuna and Mithra, and that Mithra has therefore no remaining ethnicity according to his teaching. Newbery argued that Mithra was a god of the night, and that since Zoroaster attributed his role to Ahura Mazda, Mithra had no place in Ursprung, Vision Pantheon, and the Gemeinde. And the Gata Gemeinde. Zener stated that Zoroaster did away with uh, all personal God except Ahura Mazda himself and the Holy Spirit. Or the other groups were strongly opposed to his call, stated that, for example, hymns, in diesem uralten Gott der Irana und Inder, und mit dem ganzen der Mitra umgewendenen Gotte Kreise hat nach seiner Berufung Zarathustra den Kampf aufgenommen. Or Humbach um, wrote, der Daiga par excellence, aber ist für Zarathustra ohne Zweifel Mitra gewesen. There are other groups also who tactically ignored it. For example, Lomer says that, uh, and that it says only not for, not for Mitra, but for all the Yazatas in general, that uh, the Konkreten Goethe Persönlichkeiten hat Zarathustra verschwinden lassen. And he speaks of the prophets turning from them alten aus der heidnischen Naturreligion stammenden Volksreligion Mitra. Gershevich finds it unbelievable that Zarathustra should have regarded Mitra. Uh, um, um, this with detestation usually imputed to him by modern scholars, but he took things that Rasta found it necessary to exclude him from his own religion. And Russian women remained with saying that Rasta ignored Mithra. Those curious about Boy's detailed answer to all these questions can find it in the article I mentioned. But the question I wanted to raise is whether Mithra was really so widely ignored. Uh, by Zarathustra or the early Zoroastrian community, and what a look at the structure of the rituals and the community might probably shed more light on this very question. In the Avestan scripture, Mithra is solely linked with the light of dawn and not with the sun. His association with the sun emerged later as a result of Mithra's role as a protector of contracts and his reputation for waking up early, the argument which was used by Gershevich in 1959 uh, to demonstrate that the identification of Mitra with the sun belongs to the post avestan developments. The name of the fire temples housing the second and third grade of fire, namely Daremer, which is popular in modern times, could point to this special correspondence relationship between Misra, Sun, and also the fire, to which I will come back also later again. In antiquity, the relationship between the sun and fire is already formulated in the central Old Avestan text of Yasna, for example, Yasna 36, which opens with the worship of the fire and closes with that of the sun. A long liturgy, the bit of God, for example, with its recitation begins shortly after the midnight and after seven hours allows the second hymn to the fire in Yasna 62 to fall on the moment of sunrise with the appearance of Mithra, which also points to an analogous God. <coughs> this moment is so important that the priests have to wait if the recitation won't exactly match the moment. The rule is clear from the ritual instructions transmitted up to the age of the Persian Revoyah for example, in Rewayat of Kong in Shapur from 1559 on how a bandida, the, um, the long liturgy of the night, should be consecrated. And explaining this to the question, how it could be done after going through some details, we can say it on Pisha's Anga of the Birun Ayat, the Atesh Niyayesh Hasen, the Ayat Nishastanta of the Birun of Pish Gazashtan. So, but before the sunrise, if the priest approaches the recitation of the Atash Niyayesh, that is Yasna 62, he should wait until the sun rises, then proceed to eat and recite it that, or that, um, at that time. Kellens in 1979 could argue for Mithra as the deity of the illuminated sky and a link with solar symbolism, which extends his association beyond the light of dawn and with the four positions of the sun sunrise, sunset, midnight, and noon. Back to the five watches of the day, 
which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, it was Humba who could determine that the old Abyssinian texts recognize only three divisions of the day in terms of ritual, that is Usha for dawn, Pitzva uh, for noon, and Khishab for night, rather than the commonly known five in younger Abyssinian texts and also in the living tradition. The position of Mithra is according to certain statements ordered before the sun, following them are stars and moons and sun. And as Gert Koenig has shown recently, according to the sequences of the Nyoyesh, and especially the twin structure of Nyoyesh 1 and 2, Mitra is ordered parallel to the sun. Bearing this in mind, Kellens in 2016 emphasized Mitra's role in converting the three ritual divisions of the day into the five, adding and starting with sunrise. One year later, Cantera, in 2017, made an important contribution to reconstructing the religious reform that took place under the Achaemenids, which the introduction of the Zoroastrian calendar is the clearest manifestation of that, in a very expansive way in Rite and Pantheon, including the insertion of the solar beings Mithra and Yima in central positions. Following Cantera's argument, Mithra is associated with both sunshine and sunlight in contrast to the astral body and holds the title of the god of boundary time. This includes significant moments trans, uh, of transition between day and night, such as twilight and sunset, and sunrise and sunset, as well as the metonomic moments between summer and winter, namely the equinoxes and thus play a major role in transformation, uh, in transforming the ritual parts of the day. He argued that the adoption of the solar calendar was responsible for this change. The day and the year were linked through um, analogies around the axis defined by Mithra, who was connected to both equinoxes, celebrated through the festival of Mihragan, corresponding to the Avestan festival Haiti Fahaya, and the start of the new ritual year during the spring in our equinox. During the first week of the year, various celebrations dedicated to the Amishas Pandals were held and the liturgical season of each um, Asniaratu was introduced on the different day. This connected the parts of the day with the concept of the year and even for the first week. In this context, Ventura also suggested that the standard Yasna um, that is the Yasna with the dedicatory of no Nova, which features Misra prominently, was originally the Yasna for the celebration, uh, celebrating the opening of the new ritual year at the first sunrise after the spring equinox. This means that the Yasna with the dedicatory um, of no Nova was likely created for being performed at Havani, that is the first watch of the day, the sunrise watch, after the vernal um, or the spring equinox, and that is the celebration of the new year, no rules. This evidence also reminds the well-known mediator role of Mithra, according to the representation by Plutarch as the god in the middle, in the East and the, um, and the Osiride, which I don't want to go through into detail, but some Experts of the field um, are already present here, Professor Garak Wolf, and probably later um, my colleague Dr. Malju will um, um, address this later today. To put it simply, in the Zoroastrian calendar, the position of the god Mithra is very important. It falls in the middle of both months and the year, on the sixth day of the seventh month. The year is divided into 12 months of 30 days and each quarter is marked by an event. The spring equinox, which is the month of, and the month of Barbardine, and the autumn equinox, which belongs to Mer, and the, and the month is called after him, Mitra, summer solstice for Tish, uh, with Tish and Tish, uh, or Tishtria, and the winter um, um, solstice um, with the name of Dai, um, belonging to Ormast. The six Amshas fans are also included into the quarters where water fire includes in the third quarter. Mithra here represents the middle point, and this has different meaning depending on the context, from both marking the beginning and middle of the ritual year 
from the cosmic point of view, from the ritualistic and cosmic point of view um, um, of the gods, and as well as this, to distinguish between the truths and falsehoods from the social, um, um, logical, and legal perspective, which reflects in his the meaning of his name as contract or god of contract. Now let's see how these important functions of Mitra in framing the ritual year uh, might have left traces in the later ritual affairs. As I've already mentioned, within the living Zoroastrian tradition, the fire temples housing the second and third grade of fire are called Darimir, which literally meaning the court of Mitra. The cult of the ever-burning fire as is known today in the Iranian and Indian communities, knows a three-party par um, three division into classes and grades, which partly quantitative and partly qualitative distinction, um, as you can see here in the slide. So we have the highest grade um, of fire, that is the Bahram, the victorious fire, um, um, uh, which is foundation is very long, costly, very complex. Today, there are only nine, um, 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 Atash Bahrams, eight in India, one in Iran, and um, so on. Probably there will never be an, an, another Atash Bahram. It is um, already impossible to install um, a new one. Um, there are the second grades are the Adurans. So there are um, also the um, um, foundations could be um, um, long and complex, but less long and complex. It will be also impossible also to imagine the installment installment of new other one. And the less uh, and, the, and the third category is the of God um, which is also sometimes um, parable with the sacrificial fire, so it's a short temporary and um, it is um, easier to maintain. So all um, all the other lesser grades of um, uh, fire temples mostly includes uh, um, houses adopt God fire. So here um, you can see two examples, one from Iranian side, one from Indian side of um, the Darimir, so the, um, um, called in um, with, um, Gujarati Agiari. The Parsis have used two terms, the Persian Darimir, as you already know, and the Gujarati Agiari um, uh, interchangeably to refer to the place of worship. The term Darimir is also commonly used by the Zoroastrian in Iran as well. It is customary for every Iranian Darimir to contain a sacred, ever-burning fire. And the term Agyari in Gujarati also simply means the house of fire. However, there are Parsi Agyaris that nowadays have no permanent fire. Um, here I have also some more materials. If you um, can see how inside of the um, Darimir the drop log, so it is not the uh, Atash Bahram, so it is um, the structure of temples for um, lesser um, 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 great fires. Um, you see here the, the, the plan of the Shapurji Baharucha Darimir in Baharuj was rebuilt in 1924. And um, in, the, uh, in, in the elevation plan, you can see that there is an entrance there and there's prayer hall. Then we have Gumbat Hane, the Sanctum Sanctorum, which houses the fire. And um, beside, in, in, and there is a room, um, room number four, and um, um, number four, which is um, which is um, the pavis. Um, I'm, I'm, I will come back to it. It would be important for um, the next points. So the Dalmir is a general building where the priest can perform the high rituals in isolation and strict purity. The structure contains a few essential elements needed for the solemn Zoroastrian rituals, namely. A um, paved area divided into separate areas or pavis that could be purified, uh, purified and consecrated. That is the, the, um, the place um, number four here in this slide. Um, it co there contains also a well that both provided pure water and um, um, how the water offering made after each um, high liturgy, so the water can be um, pured um, and dedicated to the, um, to the waters. Um, and and um, there are also um, um, a palm tree for the barstone ties um, and um, one or two pomegranate uh, fruit, which also um, are needed um, for the rituals. 
as well as areas that are outside um, um, the areas for the goats and for holding the goats for the milk also be mixed um, um, with the pressed hauma uh, in the long liturgy and also a place for the sacred food, the vayasiyaji, um, uh, which um, um, it, uh, is really, uh, urine will be important for um, purification rituals. Of course, there must always be a fire during the celebration of the rituals. I think now it would be more than clear that naming the house of the holy fire addresses this um, special correspondence relationship between the Mitra as Lord of Ritual, proceeding over the performance of rituals, sun, and also the fire. So that is what we saw also in the onomastic uh, names uh, presented by um, Professor Charity. The Daramir provides also a sacred and protected place for the priestly initiation ceremonies. When a young priest, the priest's sons, initiated in his turn into the caste of priesthood, it means when he has undergone the Nozud ceremony, as it's called in Iran, or the Nadar, as it's called among Parsis. By then, he becomes an associate or hamkar of the Darimeh. The priest candidate goes, three, um, and goes there to the Darmer for his initiation carrying a ceremonial ox-headed mace. This represents, as you can already imagine, the mace which Mitra employs again demons. And it is a symbol of the fight which he himself is about to take up as priest against the power of evil. The initiation ceremony lasts four days on each of which the candidates celebrate the yasna and Baj with different dedications. At each service, the maize lies on the ground inside the pali between the alat khan and um, the offering gun of the fire. Its head toward the south and the ox face turned toward the east, the quarter of the rising sun and coming of Mithra. So here you see, some of the young priests by the initiation uh, ceremonies holding this, uh, this mace. The first day of the initiation ceremony of Navar includes recitation of the Yasna and Rome, which is special the dictatory of Nov Navar, which I already uh, mentioned. In the modern praxis, um, the Yasna, the dictatory of uh, Nov Navar, is performed in order to enable the celebrating priest for the celebration of the long liturgy by which Mithra is prominently featured, placing the mace of Mithra between the Alad Khan, that is the ritual table, um, uh, which the main um, officiating priest is sitting behind, behind it and, the, um, and contains all the ritual implements, and the offering Nigan, that is the base containing the ritual fire, reflects the symbolic establishment of ordinating a new priest with Mithra, who is responsible for the order of the ritual calendar, and all this happened in um, ha and all this happened in Havanga, the first division of the day, lasting from dawn until noon under personal ju and, um, and jurisdiction of Mithra. The vast majority of ritual ceremonies carried out by Hamkar priests at the Darimir are specifically reserved for the Havanga and cannot be conducted elsewhere. Additionally, all major rituals, including um, the nighttime ritual, such as Vidav Dado Nirangin, requires the priests to perform the Amal uh, within the Havanga. This means that the priest must receive the ritual power through the performance of a Yashti Vistare within the Havanga on the same day as uh, of the same day of the ceremony. This clearly demonstrates again that uh, all the great religious offices need to uh, meet the power of Mithra's protection. It is not only the high liturgies that require this specially protected and consecrated place to be performed, and so they are performed in the fire temples, the Darren Mears. And the connection to the protection of the Mithra is obvious, but there are also ceremonies of lesser um, solemnity that can be performed outside the temple, for example, in the homes of the Zoroastrian deity. Also, these uh, ceremonies, um, the pref uh, also for these ceremonies, the preferred and ideal time falls always in the Havan God, as mostly the priests are asked to perform um, the Jashan, the most popular of the ceremony in the Havan God. 
Still in Iran, the Gahambar festivals are celebrated in the Havangah as the best and most fitting time. By this, the religious services are under Mistra's care and makes him the ultimate resort of justice. It's highly interesting to see that Iranian priests dress as Mitra in modern Iranian customs for, um, for the oldest festival of the Sabbath today, which, is, uh, which I will come back to in a moment to conclude my talk. There are also other connections to the role of Mitra in his different ritualistic capacity within the ritualistic life cycles of Zoroastrians. Among others, the custom of choosing of a special protector after the marriage ceremony in Iran, so marriage, <coughs> which, is its, which is in itself a contract, so hence again the role of Mitra. Between the power, there are three deities to choose from, Mir, Bahram, and Ashtar. Boys notices once that the special devotion of the Achaemenid and Sasanian royal houses to Mithra and Anaita may be considered in the same light, even if on a more exalted level. This is also evidently as Mithra stands behind Ardashir II and Tawe Bostan in his two capacities, one as protector supervising over a pact of kingship and also as the god of supervising the correct performance of the investiture ritual. Viewed in context, Mitra's role as a protector of divine services and a judge in the afterlife can be understood as that of a powerful and important Yazata who ultimately serves the great God Ahura Mazda. It also explains why the fire temples, the most important and consecrated places of worship, is dedicated to Mithra and calls after him the court of Mithra, Daramir, rather than that of Ahura Mazda. Because the great god is regarded as so elevated that it would be insolent for mortals to construct the place of worship under, uh, named after, after him. Now I come gradually closer to my conclusion. Mithra's prominent role in the reorganization of the liturgical calendar is highlighted in the calendar itself. He is the patron of the new um, Asniaratu, which begins at the sunrise. His festival, the Mehragan, was the most important after the new year and was celebrated at the um, autumnal equinox. And um, the months under his patronage also <coughs> began with, uh, with the fall equinox. Last but not least, the new year was opened after the spring solstice with a very special ceremony created at hoc, the standard Yasna liturgy, also known as the Yasna Nova, as you already know, in which Mithra occupies the most prominent place in the dedication. The liturgical calendar provides evidences of Mithra's significant role in its uh, reorganization in the Achaemenid period, the calendar which is still the base for the solemnization of daily, monthly, and yearly rituals of the highest importance for the organization of the priestly activities. Mithra is the patron of the, of the new Asniaratu, which commences at sunrise, and this is emphasized in the calendar itself. The Mehrigan festival, which is celebrated in, in the summit um, uh, economy in his honor, is the second most important festival after New Year, and the months under his patronage all the starts with this event. Withdrawal association with the two greatest of the six Rastran seasonal festivals, Barbara Nigan, culminating in Noruz and Mirigan, are now also clear. The solemnization of the intercalation ceremonies for Mitra and Ruz Mir of Mav Mir, that is Mirigan, is probably the only and rare occasion in the performance of high rituals that, according to the investigations of Pantera, the preliminary dedication of Ormas, which is always at the first place for all performances of the Zoroastrian um, liturgies, may be omitted. And the lesser Shnuman that begins immediately with the words Shnumana Yisraere Vor Gaudaurish, also with the name of Mithra. Additionally, the new year was also integrated with the unique ceremony that um, 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 mark it at the beginning of, of, um, of, of the year. It is also the standard ceremony, as I've, um, um, uh, as I've shown, um, for the beginning of the priestly life. It is a ceremony that um, um, starts 
the cycles of priestly initiations, in which Mitra is featured. This highlights Mitra's influential role in the liturgical calendar, and as a result, in the ritual, liturgical structure of the faith, affecting all aspects of life of the Zoroastrians. Last but not least, I wanted to close my talk with a further iconographical hint to the Nahleven, or maybe reviving of the idea of Mitra as the priest by excellence in the modern Zoroastrian religious imagery, in which this very special priestly role might be also seen behind the transformation of the Mitra's iconography as a priest from the Achaemenite up to the modern time. So you are all familiar with these two um, samples, the representation of the priest, probably the Russian priest, and several mm -hmm. what we call plot from the Oxus Persia, um, dated to the 5th, 4th centuries BCE, showing bearded priest in, ho uh, in hood and tonic, some with the traditional moth covering, the padan. Walking to the right, holding a bundle of the sacred ties of Barson in hand, which clearly make a reference to the performance of the long liturgies. This iconographic uh, relation between um, this sample from the Achaemenid period and the well-known depiction of Mithra by the investiture scenes of Ardashir II at, at Tawabostan can hardly be overseen. The symbolic act of priestly presence of Mithra clearly marked by the sun rays behind his head and holding the barsom in hands is evident. This imagery was the inspiration for the, Zora, uh, for the Zoroastrians in modern times to see the Sasanian representations of Mithra in his capacity as the lord of the rituals, as the template, as forelocket for picturing the very priest Tarik the prototype of high priests, the prophet Zarathustra himself. This reflection now is part of the Zoroastrian religious imagery and continues to represent the priests as Mithra, Lord of the rituals. Misraim, Bauru Gawaitim, Hazankrem, Gaushaim, Babarem, Chashmanem, Achtam, Naumanem, Yazatem, Yazamaide. Thank you for your attention. So we have questions. So one and two. Go ahead. You first, and then the second. So uh, uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, one question or other suggestion maybe is that um, in in the Rig Vedas we have Agni as the priest god, and uh, it seems very much similar to. Uh, the role of Mitra in Iranian science and uh, uh, even like in the down uh, its relation to getting the sun. Uh, how, what do you think about like its uh, Iranian Mitra association with the, with the original Iranian fire deity that then uh, bore, I mean, transferred to Mitra or uh, I think in Greek Veda a couple of times Mitra, Mitra and uh, Agni are associated, but not, of course, uh, what I think identified. But yeah, what do you think about? So that is the same association that you see. So Mitra is also associated and connected with yeah. with fire. So that the same pattern does exist. So we don't yes. we do, do not need to connect Mitra with Agni because we have the connection and the parallelism of Mitra. Um, um, with the sun and also with the fire, as is the case for the fire temples. Um, and um, and, and um, being a priest in that, that capacity, is something also is known, for example, the, the, the Mebat fire and also the Hauma. So there are several deities that act as a priest. So, for example, the Hauma in Iranian tradition is also depicted as a, as, as a priest. But the same analogy so we have here, which is not surprising. So, the whole pattern is an uh, ancient Indo Iranian pattern. So. It is clear that we have the same also in, in, the, in, the, in, in the Vedic um, tradition. So the parallels are all there. Sheldon, thank you for a very exciting presentation. Uh, my, my small point will be about the interpretation of Mithra as mediator, an intermediary. Uh, you have proposed, like, uh, there is almost a consensus that uh, it, 
it is linked with Mithra's place in the calendar. There is another proposal, which is actually not exclusive from the other one. Uh, and uh, I think it has been it has been proposed, among others, by Jean Kellens, but maybe also by others, that it should refer, actually, to Mithra's intermediary position between the unlimited time and the limited time. Which is Mithra, uh, first, well, limited time till, uh, begins under the sun. Uh, uh, everything, the, 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 uh, the division of the year is commanded by the sun. Above, we are in unlimited time. And Mithra, as lord of the, uh, 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 master of the covenant, is a warrant for um, uh, our Mazda and Ahriman's uh, agreement uh, to rule in terms. Uh, I can't quote a precise reference and I don't remember exactly upon which passages uh, Kellens was uh, relying, but uh, I would like to know what you think about it. Yes, yes, that, um, I, I think it's very correct, and thank you for, um, for um, referring to him. It's also um, 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 mentioned by Kellens, and um, also Cantero um, 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 also mentioned that. So um, I, I think it's correct because um, the, the rituals per se are, um, um, are where the, the, hum, the human um, from the limited time come into connections with the unlimited time. So that is that is the moment that the gods are um, um, invited to the air. So th this role fits very good to to, to, to the suggestion that uh, Mithra also um, overs oversights on, on this pact and also this role of the mediator. Of, I think it is it is very correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for this illuminating. Okay, so this morning I have the feeling that we are uh, we have started with the giants in the field. So um, this morning session will conclude with our third speaker, Professor Franz Grenet, who since 2013 has been a professor at the Collège de France and chair of history and cultures of pre-Islamic Central Asia. He is the leading figure in the history and archaeology of Central Asia and the history of Zoroastrianism. He has published extensively on funerary practices in Central Asia, the multi-volume history of Zoroastrianism among his many books and articles. Professor Jornet is president of the European Society of the Study of Cultures of the Himalaya and Central Asia. Was. Was, okay. <laughs> Thank you. He has a spectacular archaeological experience. He has been the director of the French Uzbek archaeological mission in Sogdiana, among others, excavating at Samarkand and other sites in Uzbekistan. Today, he will talk to us on Mithra in the Eastern Iranian religions state and limits of the documentation. Let us please welcome. That's the one. Where, uh, okay. We can hear you. Why do, why do we, where That's is the light. microphone? This no, one. We can hear you. That's you can, okay. okay. I, I speak loudly. Uh, well, first I wish to express my warm thanks to uh, the organizer, Matthew and uh, Touraj, for inviting me. At this conference, uh, it uh, had not I had not uh, been busy with Mithra for quite a long time, but it was always a topic dear to me, and probably um, it comes from my adolescence because uh, um, maybe probably you don't know, but the grammar school where I was educated in the Gallo-Roman city of Julio Bonnat in Normandy, today Lillebon, was built over a Mithra. Uh, so I have lived uh, under Miswa's umbrella for all, all my life. <laughs> uh, 
Well, uh, on this, uh, how, uh, how do I comment the, the, the slide? There is a keyboard. Uh, keyboard in the, in the keyboard. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, Miss Ryan, the Eastern Iranian region, state and limits of the documentation. On this topic, I presented the first survey in 2001. Uh, followed by a summary in Encyclopedia uh, Iranica, this was iconography in Iran and Central Asia, which I should update now. Since then, the state of the documentation has progressed, not to a very great extent, but some documents need to be reinterpreted, and surely the time is right for an update. One should first remember that according to the Miryasht, Nisra's proper home is the central Hindu Kush. More precisely, the Baniyan region. Here, is clearly associated with Mount Hara, uh, uh, linked, in the, linked in the text with uh, the, the country Ishkata. Uh, and from there, his gaze at down embraces the western and northern regions watered by the rivers Murgab, Herirud, and Oxus, whose tributaries, southern tributaries, are actually the Balkh Ab and the Kunduz Ab rivers, which also surge in the Banyan and Band Yamir region. The emblematic uh, image uh, of this daily rise of Misra is a huge painting which once adorned the vault of the 35 meters Buddha at Bamiyan, before it was destroyed uh, by the Taliban, as everything else there. Uh, perhaps in the Buddhist context, it alludes to Buddha's identification with the sun, but actually the image does not contain any Buddhist iconographical element. All these else find parallels in the Miryasht, the gold painted mountain tops all around. Uh, the duplicate figure of the wind, wa uh, Vata, uh, on top. The goddess Ashi as the charioteur, uh, faintly visible. Yeah. Uh, and less directly, the symbols of daylight and moonlight, respectively as an archer, daylight, and moonlight as an Athena like figure holding a human-faced shield. The two half-bird, half-human creatures on both sides, for which I had not been able for a long time to propose a satisfactory explanation, have since been recognized on Sogdian, partly by Boris Marshak, on Sogdian usheries and Sino-Sogdian funerary reliefs. And they have been, this figure has been, this hybrid figure, has been identified as uh, Octor Sherpe, as Parodash, the roster priest who attends Srosh at the time of the morning prayer. Well, it was surplus at down and in the Miriash Srosh is mentioned. This complex image has an analogy with a more compact composition shown on the Sassanian seal. It remain of an iconography of Mithra rising over the mountain, of which another offshoot, offshoot is perhaps the western Mithra Petrogenus. In the other direction, echoes of the Bamiyan composition, um, echoes of the Bamiyan composition or of its predecessors can be recognized in Buddhist caves in Kucha and in Dunhuang. And even in Dunhuang, the shield-bearing figure is still, is still depicted. So um, uh, um, this morning, it has been, uh, it has been uh, 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 Turaj has mentioned that uh, Mithra skull spreads from the Atlantic uh, to Central Asia, no, even as far as China. And actually, in modern Chinese, the only religious world which has an Iranian origin is the name of Sunday, Mir. Actually, only two sets of images produced in the East 
are explicitly labeled as Mithra. Cushion coins in the second century showing a juvenile, juvenile Apollinian type. No, it's okay. I can. And rare Cushano Sasanian issues from the la late third century where the enthroned god has appeared, like on some Sasanian images. The Apollonian juvenile type can be traced to the obverse coins of the Kushan king Vimataktu, about 90 to 100 AD, where the king seems to substitute Mithra's bust for his own, and the possible Mithraic epithet Soter Megas, great savior, for his own name, which is not mentioned on mentioned only on very rare codes. For all other images not labeled, the identification rests on iconographic criteria, and it is, is sometimes disputable. Such is the case for the earliest images of Mithra so far proposed on <coughs> on the coins of, from the last Greco-Bactrian king, Heliocles, um, and some of his Indo-Greek successors. As you know, David Bivar was the first to draw attention to it. It starts with an evolution of the traditional image of Zeus, but now provided with rays, an attribute which classical scholars used to consider not typical of Zeus except in cases where he is assimilated to a local sun god. Subsequently, under Hermaeus, a hooded cap appears between the rays, until eventually the bust is hardly recognizable at Zeus anymore, and looks rather like Mithra on the Nimrudak reliefs. Furthermore, it is associated with a horse, Mithra is a sacrificial animal. Some time ago, I suggested that the Zeus of the main temple of Aichanum, of which the only parts preserved are a foot with a thunderbolt on the hand, was actually a Zeus Mithra, instead of Zeus Ahura Mazda, as proposed by Paul Bernard. Hence, his reconstruction, uh, reconstruction of the statue. Other candidates have since been proposed for a postulated local counterpart of Zeus at Aichan, Bell, the Oxus, Fayou. The question remains open today. Uh, on the Nimrudag reliefs, actually, Zeus Haura Mazda also wears a tiara. And the hybrid type of the Indo Greek coins has no clear successor in Bactrian or Gandharan iconography. Except for the coins already examined, the Eastern Iranian iconography of Mithra in the period prior to the 6th century, the date of the Babylon image, is reduced to two seals. A ceiling from Kafir Kala near Samarkand, unfortunately, this is the only image we have, uh, you have to believe me, showing Mithra <laughs> enthroned and handling a ring to a smaller kneeling worshipper holding a spear. And a crude scene, probably from Aracosia, which seems to anticipate the Balian composition. Mithra in his chariot and with the two, uh, the two archers, which, are, which could be images of sun and uh, of, 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 of daylight and moonlight. Uh, subsequently, a few works from Tenjikate, Sogdia in Sogdiana, dating from the 6th to early 8th century, can be plausibly identified as Mithra, um, either from the solar rays and from the Rohor <coughs> chariot, a bust painted in Temple 1 with worshippers. You see the halo here. Uh, a figure on a horse. Uh, a figure on a horse throne in a private house, it's obviously a god and not a king because he's framed by an arch. So it is a, it is a cult image. Uh, also, a wooden panel, which is part of a series of planetary figures. One can also add 
probably a wooden statue from a cave in the upper Zerafshan Valley, nude but initially dressed and armed, with a sun and moon brass ornament behind his head. The latest image of Mithra in Sogjana is in the blue hole of the royal palace at Shahristan, uh, in Ustushana, actually the palace of the Afshis of Ustushana, probably from the late 8th century, where it occupied the center of the rear wall, the normal place for a divine image in a Sogjan house. It is a more elaborate version of the Penjikan painting. Elsewhere in the Charmistan set of paintings, a royal character seated in a chariot, drawn by winged horses, uh, and taking part in a battle scene, formerly identified also as Mithra, including by myself, has been recently reinterpreted, also by myself, as Keikos in an epic cycle, culminating with the Second War in Mazanderan. The ultimate textual attestation of Mithra anywhere in the Iranian world is a mention by Al Masudi of the destruction of a temple of the sun in Fergana by an Abbasid army after 833. Because of the insistence on the solar character in this text, as well as in the Sogdian paintings, Boris Marchak once suggested that the Sogdian had in mind the sun god Hwar instead of Mithra. But the Sasanian Mithra is solar as well in all, in all his images. And in the Bactrian language, Mir is the name for the sun. To conclude this survey of images, the Sino Sogdian sarcophagus, that of Yuhong, dated in 592 is possibly the only document alluding to Mithra's role as judge of the dead. Uh, according to me, Mithra appears here as a young rider with a solo or nimbus, meeting the sacrificial horse brought to him from the other side of the gate of, gate of paradise. Well, it, here the images have been um, uh, reunited, but actually they are separated, and what uh, it opens to uh, there is an opening giving view to a, a, a scene of paradise. Uh, here is the young rider with, and the solar rays are very, are very distinct here. And he's young, isn't he? Um, I am, I'm really convinced this is Mithra. And possibly the same sacrificial horse is present in the famous ambassador's painting at Samarkand. And this, this horse is brought by priests in a procession to the mausoleum of the royal ancestors. On the Yuhong, on the reliefs from the Yuhong uh, tomb, uh, the composition surmounts animals which are all solar symbols the lion <coughs> vanquishing the bull and the winged horse. So everything seems really to point to Mithra. <clears throat> the textual evidence is scanty. When I first published my first survey in 2001, I could mention only the Sogdian marriage contract from Mount Moon, where the oath formula is said to be pronounced in the presence of Mithra, who is Vag. Vag is the Sogdian form of Baga, God. This formula was definitely elucidated by Nicolas Sinsoufis. This is an isolated but clear evidence that besides its solar function, Mithra had kept in the East his primal function of keeper of covenants. Now we have another textual piece of evidence. The strange letter GH from the Bactrian archive of the Rogue Kingdom. Here the text in since in uh, uh, since William's translation. To Mirjaza, the god of Ulishagan, the wonderful, the grantor of favors, the renowned king of the gods, a hundred, a thousand, and ten thousand greetings and homage with the head and bended knee, prostrate.
from Nakin, the leader of Uli Shagir, his dependent and servant. And then I would be more happy when I myself might see your most divine majesty healthy and pay homage with the head and bend the knee, prostrate, as is the custom to pay homage to the most divine of gods. This is proskinesis. It's exactly what the Greeks described as proskinesis. Moreover, when I came from there, where you are, from Ulishagan, the Flamandar, the Flamandar, and in the Soviet context, it means tax collector. In the Patreon context, it means probably a tax collector, an Amil. The, the, the Flamandar arrested me, saying, when you brought both the old tax and the new tax, it remains to be assessed as far as Ulishagan. Now, Someone has come thither, thither to you from the Flamandar of Setkan, so please give him the tax. And if they want sheep to be given to him, please give the sheep there as requested. And I here will pay the gold to the Flamandar of Setkan. And with regard to the tax, do not allow any further delay to be made so that the fine may not come too much. Right. On paleographic grounds, the documents appear to date from about 470. Not everything is clear, but it appears that Nakin, lord of a place otherwise unattested, is sending this letter to the god Mithra, pleading from Yurjan Head in some tax business. Mm -hmm. Understand, he addresses the priests of the temple who manage the god's property. It seems that in his capacity of lord of the place, Nakin is personally accountable to the authorities for the collection of taxes, part of which is due by the temple for its land, land of its flocks, and which the temple has not paid in time. Well, this letter presents us with a fascinating case of Mithra, the rich god, the lord of wild pastures, the lord of covenant, turning into a tax evader. <laughs> Which conclusions can we draw from this documentation all anew? While a majority of the Zoroastrian deities mentioned in the Avesta and in the calendar are attested in one form or, or the other in Bactrian, Sogdian, and Khorasmian iconography, <coughs> most of them are known only by one or two images. Behind Nana and Vayu, Mithra is certainly the one who is most regularly attested over a long period of time from the early Kushans or perhaps earlier down to the Islamic conquest. The same conclusion can be drawn from the onomastics. It has more than once been suggested that Mithra was occupying a more dominant position in Eastern Iran than in Western, and especially Sasanian Zoroastrianism. After all, as obvious in Babylon, here he is at home. Several arguments can be produced uh, in, for this assertion. First, Mithra's possible assimilation to Zeus on Greek coins, starting from the late second century BC. Second, the fact that contrary to the Sasanians, no Kushan or Kushano Sasanian ruler is ever shown receiving the ring of investiture from Ormas, but always from other deities, Anahita, Vayu, Mithra. Third argument, uh, Mithra's Sogdian qualification as a Vag, God, God by excellence. It shows to suppose that among Sogdian personal names where Mithra is seldom attested, the frequent, name contain, the frequent names containing Vag stand from him for him. And finally, in the Bactrian letter GH, Mihriazad is qualified as the renowned, the renowned king of the gods. It is, however, possible that in such formulas, any god who is personally addressed is held as the supreme one. This is also the case with the mysterious Kamir, I mentioned in other documents. All these being said, and even admitting a certain occultation of Ahura Mazda, Mithra had strong competitors in the East for the title of High God. The most prominent competitor was the Kushan, Kushan Sasanian, and Sogdian. The most prominent competitor in the Kushan 
Kushatu Sasanian and Sogjian documentation, if the Avistan Vayu, god of space and hate, whose name was rendered in Bactrian as Wesh and in Sogjian as Wesh Parka. He was soon syncretized with Shiva. <coughs> Kushanu Sasanian coins show the king worshipping an enthroned god, possibly an old Greek statue of Zeus. The god is designated by the Pahlavi legend Bulzorwan Diazad, the god who possesses the heads. Obviously, a translation of the Avistan sequence, Vayu Shuparo Kavya, Vayu who acts high above. Another high god, attested later on, specifically in Bactria and the regions around the Hindu Kush, is Jun, whom since Williams considers a rendering of Zuluan, god of time. His identification as a god on the large gold painting in the cliff sanctuary at Tortar in Oshirvan, near Balian, and 6th century, can be contemplated. But as this god has attributes of Mithra, Horse throne, um, yes, horse throne. Uh, the animal head around his halo, symbolizing the directions of space. He might indeed be Mithra, depicted on the side wall of the sanctuary, while the main god, possibly Jun, occupied the rear wall, now it disappeared. It was Marshak's suggestion. And finally, I would like to propose a new interpretation of the often discussed investiture, investiture relief, Taki Bostan 1, an interpretation which will slightly, um, uh, be slightly different from the one proposed just now by Shervin. Uh, this is Sasanian iconographical discourse, of course, but it has some relevance to Eastern matters. Three characters are depicted. There is consensus only for the wine, the first, the first on the left, with Miswa, identified by his solar rays. For the two other ones, there are various proposals concerning both their identity and their mode of interaction. They stand over a dead ruler, uh, whom Leo Trumpelman has definitely identified as the Roman Emperor Julian on the basis of a comparison with his last coin issued. The dominant theory, still upheld by Rachel Wood in the recent collective book Images of Mithra, is to interpret the scene as Chapur II, depicted on the right, investi investing as his successor, Ardashir II, his brother and supposed helper in the war. Well, this meets with several difficulties. <coughs> The victory occurred in 363, and the succession only 16 years later. On all known examples, the ring or wreath of investiture is handed by a god, not by a mortal. Starting from these considerations, Abdullah Sudovar, with whom I agree on some rare occasions, considers that what is shown is the investiture of Chapur II, right, by Ormazd, Center. My only objection about the, is about the order which I propose to switch. In my opinion, the prominent character is the one on the right, as he stands over the head of the enemy at a higher level than the others. He does not carry a weapon, and never <coughs> is Mithra, but the central figure as a sword. The central figure is the victorious king, and the two others are gods. The main reason why the character on the right has been most often identified as Chapur II is his mural crown. It is Chapur's usual crown, but it is also <coughs> worn by Ormast and all the investigators <coughs> where he appears. Ardashir I, Chapur I, Wahram I, Khosrow II. Here, it might have looked improper to give the king the same crown as the god he is invested by. And actually, on some coins, Chapur II wears the pearl studded calot, worn here by the central character. 
Returning to the unquestionable Misra figure, another vexing question is the significance of the lotus flower on which he stands. Abolona Sudova, recently approved by Rachel Wood, has advanced a complicated theory linking this symbol with Apamnapat as a reminder of the absent Anahita. Ferdinand Justi and more recently Martha Carter seem to be on a fairer path when they propose to link it with India, either as a solar symbol borrowed from the sun god Surya or as an indication of Buddhist influence. But, well, why maybe, why, why, do, why does, we don't have to, to suppose a borrowing from, uh, from other religions. On several kushano sasanian issues, a lotus, sorry, yes, on several kushano sasanian issues, a lotus bud appears on the head of the ruler replacing the Corymbus. Uh, an important, an important compositional element in, of the Takibostan relief has not yet received attention. The lotus flower is on the same level as the defeated Julian, and consequently. It has the same relation with Mistra as Julian with Shapur and Ormazd. It is a hint of another victory, this time on the Eastern Front. We know, in actually, that from the 340s, Shapur II conducted a series of campaigns in the East, initially in the region south of the Hindu Kush, as far as Sindh, which was re-annexed as a province. Although the details of these campaigns have not been transmitted, they resulted in the introduction of Sassanian imperial coinage in Kapisa and Gandhara, which had been formerly delegated to the Kushan of Sassanians. Eventually, in 364, just one year after peace was established with Rome, a central mint was transferred to Kabul, no doubt in order to redirect to the Eastern, Eastern campaigns the funds previously absorbed by the Roman wars. This is the political background from which I propose to explain the left part of the Takibustan relief. Moving further, I would try the idea that the control over the Indian regions was achieved more by a submission of local rulers than by a crushing military defeat. And consequently, it was put specifically under the umbrella of Mithra, Lord of Covenant. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do we have any questions? <coughs> thank you, thank you um, for, for this very uh, nice presentation. This, um, um, just, just like a complimentary note to what you um, said about um, the Baga role of uh, Mitra. So it's just wanted to add that you you know um, very well um, that um, it is also in, in the Davison um, literature, Davison scripture, um, only Mitra and Apamnabad has also the, the, um, the, the title of um, Ahura. So um, already the importance is is there so close to um, old man's there are only two gods that have the Abhura titles yes. and one of them is yes. so I want you to add to your very good point for, for the eastern part. Sorry? No, that's um... <laughs> yes. Can I ask something completely from ignorance? Um, Mitra is associated with the chariot with horses. Uh, uh, yes. But, of course, but also <coughs> just one horse as a rider. No, he has four horses. Uh, in the text, he has four horses. Okay. Uh, no sometimes on horse. seals, they are reduced to two. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, but on the, on the Bamiyan image, there are four. Yeah, four. But he is not uh, normally associated as a rider god with one horse. 
uh, where it has been argued, uh, where I uh, because you showed the so uh, it image. has uh, that made me uh, this well in this case in this case is writing but self it might not be really specific okay. what is important is that he is receiving a horse which has no rider which should be a sacrificial horse mm -hmm. and actually uh, on this horse we can see a piece of cloth and uh, I tried the, in an article uh, starting from other parallels. I tried to interpret this piece of cloth as the sedra. So the piece of cloth destined for the, for uh, woven in the house of the dead person, and which is supposed to clothe him in paradise. So the sedra in this case, in this case would be dispatched by the sacrificial horse and. Well, this man, this person, under under the umbrella, it can be only a king or a god, and uh, he has definitely solar rays, which do not appear everywhere, anywhere else on this relief. So I'm 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 really convinced it is Misra. Mm -hmm. And moreover, as I said, the two animal symbols below have solar implications. <coughs> Well, let us play. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, you know, in Bormian painting, when mm -hmm. you were mentioning about these two figures, yeah. yes, yeah. these two figures in the painting. Which that, ones? Yes. This one, this one. Yes. Is that comparable? With Cotus and Cotopates of Roman Mithraism? It has been proposed, but uh, there are objections. They don't, uh, none of them holds uh, a torch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something else. Uh, and so, uh, Marshak already understood that this one uh, holds an arrow. It might be Tishtria, but it might also be Usha a symbol of the uh, of daylight mm -hmm. and here athena but the question of athena is complex yeah. she's introduced here she functions clearly as a symbol of the moonlight mm -hmm. and if you read in the in the miriasht mm -hmm. during the night uh travels uh on a tra uh, travels backwards yes. over over the, the earth and in this case is <coughs> not endowed with his own light. He, you, he borrows the light of the moon. Mm -hmm. He uses the, the moon as a, as a torch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, this is probably what is meant here. Moreover, why did they take Athena? Maybe just because it was convenient. Uh, she had a shield with a human face, the Gorgonian. She, well, could, she could pass at the moon. But, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, on Kushan coins, the image of Athena, the shield, is called uh, uh, Rishto, which is Arshtat, the goddess of justice. And Arshtat is actually mentioned in the company of Mithra in the Middle East. So there is probably a set of complex associations which we do not grasp entirely. Mm -hmm. And the wings there. Ah, the wings are the right. wings are clear. They are in the right. Avesta. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, yeah. And as she there is very little which is left from the central figure. Uh, on some drawings maybe it's clear. No, yeah, here. Just her 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 her, her, her coat, her feet and wings. She's a charioter. Mm -hmm. She's a there is a female charioter. Uh, who is a goddess because she has wings. In the Avesta, she is a she. Yeah, but there is no comparison with the Roman. I would like. Their function, function is not any similar. Uh, I would like, I would like to, but for, for the oh. moment, the only reliable, the, 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 the more solid, the more solid link is this image, which is both Miswa Rising over Mount Hara, 
but depicted as a heap of rocks. And uh, when you see actually the figure of Mithra holding the spear, it's very similar to the one at, at Bamiyan. And uh, well, I would like it to be the, ori the origin of Petrogenus. Uh, the, the heap of rocks being eventually reinterpreted as just a rock. But I'm not, well, it has been proposed also by others. Uh, just uh, Maybe something. I, read a lot of I would like it to be true. Okay. Maybe I read a lot of others. <laughs> So we can certainly continue our conversation over lunch. But for now, let us uh, please thank our speakers for the presentation. And let us uh, also thank all our speakers again, because I think we had a wonderful flow. Two logistic things. We have lunch right now, but we will also take a picture of the uh, everybody with the participants in the conference. And we will resume here at 1.30.
Yeah. 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 And you can put it in the middle of the Okay, um, let's begin our first afternoon session. So, uh, the, the panel chair for this first afternoon session is Sarah Cole, uh, curator at the J. Paul Getty Museum Department of Antiquities. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, as Matthew said, my name is Sarah Cole. I'm assistant curator of antiquities at the Getty Villa um, with the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and I'll be your chair for this afternoon session. Um, which focuses on archaeologies of Mithra or Mithras between East and West. And our first speaker is Massimiliano David, who is an archaeologist and ancient historian at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. His research interests and publications are wide ranging, um, but particularly relevant for um, today's uh, workshop is uh, as director of the University of Bologna's Ostia Marina project. He and his team uncovered in 2014 the so-called Mithraeum of the Colored Marbles at Ostia, and today he will be speaking on the season of clandestine Mithraism, a case from Ostia. So please welcome uh, Dr. David. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the university of California, uh, Irvine, and the organizing committee for the courtesy of inviting me for this important event for Mitra studies. And uh, I hope not to exceed the limits of the time allotted to me. Uh, in fact, uh, I have many, many things to, to, to say, uh, I so. Uh, well, uh, the season of clandestine matrims, a uh, case from Austria, the next. Uh, approaching the state of research. If the 20th century, the next one, Next one, uh, thanks to Franz Cumont and Martin Fermaser and next one. Next one. Uh, had seen the appearance of two magnificent corpora dedicated to the collection and reorganization of all Dimitrike documentation explored throughout the Mediterranean world, the last decades of the past century and the first two decades of the present one have been marked by new discoveries, sometimes so sensational, like Awarti, next one, uh, in Syria, Angers. Um, uh, next one, uh, in France, next one, uh, Tienen in Belgium, <coughs> etc. 
etc., uh, which allow us to focus on the phenomenon with a more measured, critical, and analytical mind. In recent years, studies on Mithraism, freed from the outdated definition of Oriental cult, have significantly multiplied. Ostia, next one, has not escaped this positive direction. As known, the ancient city occupies actually in the Mediterranean area, a place of absolute importance due to the high number of Mitrea found since the 18th century. The systematic study of Mitraeus at Ostia dates back to the publication, next one, in 1954 of the groundbreaking book of Giovanni Beccati, an analytical catalog with detailed reliefs of the 16 Mitrea known at the time, published as second volume of the Scavio Ostia series. The documentation thus assembled formed the base <laughs> for the preparation Next one of the Ostia records in the corpus of monuments and Mitraic inscriptions by Martin, for, uh, Martin J. Fermazeran. A further contribution came from the research of a team of scholars coordinated by Samuel Loikley in the mid 60s. This one, uh, the heartbreak. Uh, these cornerstones were followed by the synthesis works of Maria Floriani Squarciapino and Filippo Corelli. More recently, Mithraeus et Ostia has been, next one, studied by Michael L. White since uh, 2001, director of the UT Osma project at the University of Texas in Austin, who has investigated the problems of dating, distribution, and internal articulation of the Austrian Mitrea, trying to explore the local models and diachronic developments. White, white uh, clearly expressed the need for a renewed archaeological examination of the Mitraic sites, recognizing in the Mitraeum a complex and articulated structure, therefore not limited to the Speleum alone. To conclude with the most recent investigations, it is uh, necessary to, to mention at least, next one, Françoise van Heperen, who published in the Fana Templa de Lubra series, the catalog of all the places of worship in ancient Ostia, in, uh, in which even Demetria have found a broad space. According to the scholar who has top, uh, uh, taken up the subject, in a more rapid synthesis, the Mitraia of Ostia would not be the result of, a, of the widespread presence of worshippers in every district of the city and uh, would therefore not have performed a pseudo parish function. Between the second and the third century AD, their multiplication would be the result of the formation of several small communities linked to the organization of working professional associations. 
There are numerous FOSHAP specific uh, contributions, but it's necessary to mention at least the forthcoming publication of a new updated catalog of the Ostian Mitrea, the result of research carried out within the Ostian Marina project, next one, uh, which also um, involved the discovery of the so-called mitrium of colored marbles, this one. Uh, next one. Uh, Mitrains at Ostia approaching uh, the issue of the diffusion of Mitrains in the Roman Empire, it is necessary to distinguish between the set of the contemporary testimonies, sporadic, elusive, but also partisan or hostile, that contributes to understand the physiognomy of this cult and the tangible presences of the archaeological or epigraphic findings. Next one. Uh, the phenomenon is often described as an uncorrupted and unalterated monolith. For almost 500 years of widespread presence in the Roman world, actually Mitrains experienced over time significant transformations due to an extremely dynamic social context. context. In a city like Ostia, largely rebuilt starting from the Hadrian era and slowly disappearing <coughs> between the fifth and the eighth century, a sensation of the presence of communities of Mitraic worshippers are particularly broad around 20. In the middle of the third century, Mitraic seats were widely distributed in the city and the establishment of new ones did not stop. Chronology, which at Ostia is often supported by very little evidences, places the construction of two extremely important Mitraea Around, uh, right around this time, Demetrium of Felicissimus, this one, and Demetrium of the Snakes, next one. Next one. The first one is well known for the iconographic themes of the black and white floor mosaic, in many ways able to explain rituals and nature of the community. The second is worthy of mention for its wall paintings that we see uh, now. In both cases, these seats were equipped with various rooms, among which the spileum in the form of the biclinium stood out for its sacral ceremonial and liturgical importance. These Austrian samples offer the image of a society looking for new ways of exploring the secrets of the cosmos through the tools of religion. Not only Rome, but also in the provinces, the occult, occult nature of Mitraism assumed more and more visibility, projecting itself into a public dimension as a result of the turning point of Emperor Aurelian, promoter of the relaunch of solar energies. The, relig the religious complex, next one. And Next, the religious complex of the sanctuary, perhaps financed by the cooperation of the Stupatores, 
must be considered in this historical context, within which the so-called Mitreum of Ptosus, the next one, was discovered as the inscription carved on the epistyle suggests. The text distinguishes uh, between temple, templum and speleum. Next one. Uh, Reus fructosus patronus corporis tupatorum templum et speleum mitre a solo sua pecunia fecit. The temple consisted of a single cell facing onto a central courtyard, around which there were a series of secondary rooms. Under the cell, an epsidal underground room has been identified, uh, preceded by a vestibule located under the podium. Here, Mitraic cult seems clearly integrated in the solar one, in a combination that is not easy to find elsewhere. I believe that the Mitraic monogram of a very, here you see, uh, of a very elementary form appearing in the description should not be considered casual, but an, an expression of a new historical phase in Mitraic proselytism. Monograms even more elaborated. Next one. Carved on, dif uh, on different occasions at Ostia spread during the fourth century. Mitraic monograms are attested in public buildings such as the case you see now, uh, such as the forum baths, fully active in the fourth century. In the century of Constantine and Theodosius, no newly built mitrea are attested at Ostia. Uh, perhaps due to, to the saturation reached during the third century, but also due to the progressive exhaustion of the propulsive thrust of the Mitraic movement, no future buildings appeared necessary. <coughs> Mitraism coexisted with Christianity for a long time during the fourth century. However, in the last decade, the legislative measures of Theodosius and his co-regents the so-called Theodosian decrees opened the way, the way for the affirmation of Christianity, pushing all the co-present and competing religions into a blind alley. Mitrea were gradually closed. Without legal protection, they are, they are also exposed to destructive raids that have precise archaeological evidence. Next one. We can think of some often cases, such as the Mitrium of the Bath of Mithras, this one. Next one. Next. Where the cult statue was shattered or the mitrium, next one, of the painted walls where the altar was struck. Similar cases are archaeological attested, next one, in Sarbour near Metz and in Königshofen near Strasbourg with the destruction of Mitraic cult statues. A new mitrium, next one. Archaeological investigation carried out by the Austrian Marina project since 2007 have identified along the Via della Marciana, next one, near, next one, near the so-called building of two staircases 
here in orange, uh, a trapezoidal uh, shaped uh, building erected ex novo in opus listatus and listatum mixtum. The copona, a tavern, next one, with a kitchen and a, pen, and a, a pantry, datable to the mid third century, was organized. Next one. This one, room number three, around a wide rectangular hall with a black and white mosaic pavement. Next one. The hall opened onto the street with a large entrance equipped with a counter pour, for pouring out wine and flanked to the west, south and east side from secondary variously divided rooms. The access, uh, the previous, maybe better, the previous one, no. Okay, 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 perfect. The access from the street was through a vestibule in which we have found fragments of a ceiling painted in linear style. The Copona also had an upper terrace accessible by an external staircase. The floor of the main hall was entirely covered by a black and white mosaic. Another one, the, the next one. Originally extending over the entire surface of the room. Inside the central field, the gold pen stands in a particular tough, controversial pose with the arms tied behind his back. The god, horned and hairy, with a small swaying tail and goat legs, seems to take the first steps of a dance as a modern Japanese sumo wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> From this scene, the Kaupona takes its name. In the same room as Mole, next one, Bronze of Venus of the second, third century AD was found and of the so-called type <coughs> Venus with the apple, quite common in small Roman sculpture. Another object that can be related to the activities held in the building is, next one, a bone handle probably of a small knife decorated with a dog about to jump. Many game dice and coins came from the excavation, next one. Next one and next. The coins recently published by Andrea Garibaldi and Stefano Letoni cover a chronological period from second century AD to Julian the philosopher and indicate that the use of the Caupona must have lasted for about a century. The patterns of the building exploiting pre-existing architectural structures linked to the Caupona, a basement space which can be interpreted as a speleum for the ceremonies of a Mithraic community. This interpretation is led not only by the particular plan of the room, an elongated rectangle preceded by the vestibule, but also by the discovery during the excavation of some altar lamps, next one, and bulls had lamps. Next one. At the end of the fourth century, it is in this new social context and specifically in the suburban maritime district 
now become one of those sordid places. Next one. Sordentes loci, recorded by the inscription, Chil 14, 47, 21, translatum ex sordentibus locis adornatum fori ed ad facem publicam curante Azio Clementino Viro Clarissimo Prefecto Annone. Uh, uh, that um, mm, the Caupona of Gotpan was acquired by a small Mitraic community. Perhaps, next one, uh, perhaps of a syncretic nature uh, in close contact uh, with other non Christian religious communities like the worshippers of Isis, which are extracted it and preserved the mosaic pavements, but also remade the walls in painted plaster imitating marble surfaces. On a wall of the Calpona, next one, uh, an interesting Mitraic graffito was carved with an invocation to God Mithras and God Cronos, maybe by a certain Concordius. Invicto Deo, Arrow, Mitre, bow with arrow, Deo Magno, Crono. In the same room, South Wall, other Mitraic monograms have been identified. With the new arrangements of the fourth century, room seven was enlarged by annexing the small corridor in front. Uh, next one, Concordius here, yeah. next. Uh, room seven was enlarged. Uh, the decoration of the walls is characterized by a circle painted in imitation of marble slabs. Above uh, these, uh, within a red frame, the upper register is sprinkled with red rosebuds in a, on a white background, according to a decorative practice known as scattered flowers. Next one. The flowers are distributed irregularly on the surface as if uh, uh, they were descending from above in free fall. It is likely to think that the walls rose from the walking surface for about three meters, and it's therefore possible to state that decoration, that the, the decoration as a whole is preserved from 24% uh, of the total. There are now uh, 66 source buds, which perhaps were part of a more complex pictorial system. In fact, in this type of decoration, the flowers could be accompanied by festoons, garlands, and calathoi of flowers and fruit, sometimes inhabited, uh, inhabit inhabited by birds. Uh, if the team of roses, uh, you know, uh, it's not so necessary to uh, remind the, the text by Apuleius, uh, if the team of roses in room number eight could be considered as a sign of devotion to Isis, one should certainly think of an immediately planned and not occasional presence of a community of worshippers of the goddess, as confirmed by the discovery, next one, of an Isaac crown and an ivory handle of a sistrum. Next one. On the next one. On the eastern wall of room number three, a large and detailed depiction, depiction of a ship is engraved, next one, surmounted by some letters. 
The kill is ashed with the two rather oars well drawn. The vessel has a mast with two bollards emerging from the side. At the stern, in addition to the shrouds that descend from the mast, there is an, the image of a square lattice sail or a sort or quarter deck or a cage. At the bow are two shrouds and perhaps three letters, mess, possibly part of the ship's name. The graffito does not seem to have a descriptive character and does not reproduce a ship actually in use. The actual shape of the hull makes it look like an ancient Egyptian ship with a lunar profile. It could be a reference to the Navigium Isidis, which on 5 March was carried in procession in the celebration in the celebrations in honor of the goddess, which marked the resumption of navigation and which in late empire was apparently brought uh, forward to the first days of January. Cults from Alexandria are largely documented in Ostia during the Imperial Age. If, unlike Pompeii, the Temple of Isis is not archaeologically known, the Temple, next one, uh, of Serapis uh, has been excavated and carefully studied. There are many links between the two cults. It is obviously no coincidence that the Mitraeum of the Plantapedis was found in the same block of the Temple of Serapis. Do not forget that the kiss of a statue of Serapis constitutes the episode from which the dialogue set in Ostia of the Octavius takes its cue. Room eight, this one, has a very particular decorative pattern. On all four walls, the sockle is decorated by a centrally placed trident, flanked on both sides by two arrows. Um, from the trident, vegetal shoots wrapped up in spirals are generated. This decoration, fully inserted into the tradition of Roman wall painting in a mitraic environment, is charged with a sim specific symbolic value. The arrow, but also the three arrows of the trident, are clearly connected to the mitraic symbology, since Mithras is an archer, and archers are the Dadophori, who for a triad with the god. This billion, in room number one, we can recognize, next one, this billion, next one, next one, uh, the spelium of Dimitrium, narrow and elongated, as, as uh, prescribed by the Dimitrium architectural tradition, uh, it has a, a peculiar ca characteristics that clearly differentiate it from the other metria excavated in Austria. The room, small in size, was uh, equipped with a ritual well, a flower bed, maybe for a sacred plant, and a single low bench raised from the floor about 20 centimeters to support a long cleaner for banquets or ritual meals, as was also found in the case of Dimitrium at Awarte in Syria. Next one, notches and, uh, for the placement of altars are visible on the floor. It is characterized by a colored marble pavement that justifies its name, Dimitrium of colored marbles. Each element of the geometric pattern of the pavement is carefully made with the just opposition of reused irregular marble fragments, which amount to about um, 
500 pieces. Next one, the stratigraphic deposit of the retail well. Here, the corridor. Here, the threshold. And next one, corridor here, yeah, okay. The notches for the altar, okay. And the tronus, the area for the tronus, the flower bed, and the well, the ritual well. Okay. Um, the stratigraphic deposit of the ritual well built with bricks based on a large dolium. Next one was investigated in 2016. Uh, At this one, uh, yes, is the, um, you see here, the neutrium by, um, of uh, Awati. Uh, the deposit is composed of four different layers. The most recent one was composed of many stones and bricks. At the bottom, uh, next one, here, Okay, at the bottom, there was a bronze coin of Trebonianus Gallus. Next one. In the most recent layer, and here we can uh, see uh, the sequence uh, of the uh, materials here. Um, next one. Next. Next, next, uh, and here we we can go to the conclusions. Uh, they completely open. Next one, and the attractive copona is converted so into an outwardly closed building camouflaged in a suburban neighbor. The structure was closed, probably on the initiative of the public force by order of the Curia of Ostia, and the ritual well was rendered unusual. The building was also deprived of any functional and decorative apparatus. Subsequently, the earthquake that struck Ostia in 542 caused the collapse of the unsafe structures. Last years of these clandestine mitrines are characterized by a significant decline of the followers by the confinement in domestic spaces and by forms of cohabitation with other non-Christian religious expressions, such as the Isaac one, which moreover, already in the third century, Tertullian recognized as somehow connected. Thank you. Thank you for that fascinating presentation. We have time to take a few questions. We have an unrelated question with the long cleaning that you described in the building. Um, is it something that is common in the region or is it unique to this building? Uh, the long clean you have seen in the Spaleum. In the building that you just showed the last slide, you said that there's a long clean, a long couch. A ah, long clean uh, yeah. in Greek. Yes. Uh, it, this one is one of the particularities of this building because we have uh, here only one bench not two, as uh, we can see in many other cases, 
Um, but uh, uh, um, it, this one is one of the main uh, principle uh, of the this phase of the mid-range, this late phase, uh, we have called uh, um, uh, secret and closed to uh, the others for many reasons. Other questions? Well, if there are no further questions, please join me in thanking Dr. Dabi for his fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will move on to the second speaker of this afternoon's panel, Lucinda Durbin. Lucinda Durbin is chair of antique religions, especially ancient Egyptian religion, at the University of Radboud in the Netherlands. She has published widely on ancient religion, particularly looking at the Hellenistic and Roman periods in Syria and Iraq, and the Roman West with a focus on Mithras. And today she will be talking about the Roman cult of Mithras and its relationship with Iran, the case study of Dura Europas. Please welcome Dr. Durbin. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, a big thank you uh, to the organizers um, for organizing such uh, a very interesting uh, conference uh, on, on a topic that has been too long. Um, as, I, as I said, this is my first conference on Mithra, uh, uh, and I'm really, really happy about it, and I think it's a great idea that you, uh, that you had. So today um, I will talk about the Roman cult of Mithras and its relationship with Iran, but then uh, in the case of Dura Europos. On February 10th, 1934, Clark Hopkins and Mikhail Rostovsev sent a telegram from Aleppo to Franz Dumont in Paris with a message, Mitrei Pain, découvert très votre tante, venez. A week later, another telegram followed, this time sent from Abu Kamal in the Euphrates just south of Dura. Peinture, a bas relief inscription important, restaurant Dura jusqu'au terme de venez. It's by no means surprising that the Yale archaeologists who were excavating in Dura at the time contacted Cumont. Franz Cumont had been the first to excavate in Dura in 1922 and 1923, where he had unearthed the so called Temple of the Feldering Gods, or Temple of Baal, located in the northwest corner of the ancient city, just a stone's throw away from the Mithraeum that had just been discovered in Block G7. Together with Mikhail Rostovsev, Cumont had remained one of the scientific directors of the joint French American campaigns that followed his excavations. But most of all, Pimon had been the leading expert on the cult of Mitras since the publication of his Texte des Monuments qui feraient relative au mystère de Mitra that were published in 19, uh, 1896 um, to 99, a work in which all known monuments and texts pertaining to, to the cult have been assembled and explained for the first time. On several occasions, Cremont had promised his American colleagues he would return to Dura once Mithraeum had been found. And indeed, notwithstanding health issues, the 66 year old Belgian scholar made the journey to Dura in February 1934, where he and his friend Mikael Rostovsen took notes on the ground for over two weeks. Uh, and this picture, of course, has since then become iconic, Franz Cumont and Mikhail Rostovsev, together in the Mitraeum in Dura Europos, in faraway Syria. 
During the subsequent excavations of the Mitraeum, it became clear that the initial enthusiasm of the Yale archaeologists was justified. The Mitraeum they had found turned out to be one of the most interesting, complete, and paradigmatic Mitraea that is known to date. Not only was it rich in paintings, which is rare in itself, but it also displayed several stages in its architectural development and decoration that is rare in Mithraea in the Roman world, and it enables us to reconstruct religious life in the sanctuary from its foundation in 1169 till its deliberate deconstruction preceding Dura's defeat by the Sassanians in 256. Apart from inscriptions, over 200 graffiti texts were found, informing us about the cultic organization and the identity of the worshippers, a richness only paralleled in the Mithraeum below Santa Prisca in Rome. Finally, all this material may be interpreted in its social and civic context, for the Mithraeum was found inside a small city, so rich in various finds dated to the first three centuries that uh, it was uh, famously called the Pompeii of the Syrian desert. For example, excavators found a Christian building and a synagogue in the same street as the Mithraeum, both decorated with paintings that are more or less contemporary with those found uh, in the final Mithraeum. The Mithraeum is, building in, is located in the northern part of the city, that in the final 70 years of the city's existence was dominated by military. And although the idea that myth was, pre was predominantly popular with soldiers can no longer be upheld, it is clear that this sanctuary was exclusively used by people connected with the army. Dura is one of the richest sites for uh, information on, third, on the third century Roman army, and particularly noteworthy are the Roman military papyri informing us about the organization and the social background of the military. In some, apart from the Mithraea in Austria near Rome, there are few Mithraea that provide us with such extensive archaeological context. All this was, of course, still unknown to Kumul when he received the telegram in 1934. It's quite certain that he was first and foremost triggered by the location of this new Mithraeum on the frontier of the Roman Empire, close to what he presumes to be the Iranian homeland of the Roman god. The total number of Mithraea found in the Eastern Roman Empire was, and still is, exceedingly small compared to finds in the West, notably in Roman Italy, Germania, and the Danube area. And Dura was, and still is, the easternmost Mithraeum that was ever found. In view of its proximity to the Parthian Empire, Kumul no doubt hoped to find here the missing link that would finally prove his theory about the eastern Iranian origin of the cult. Following the claims of Mithra's own, own Roman followers, who pictured their god in a Persian dress and adopted a number of Iranian elements and loan words such as Nama, as well as the statements of imperial writers about the cult's origin, Kimul interpreted Roman Mithraism as Romanized Mesdaism, that was still at its core a Persian religion, although it had changed first through its passage through Mesopotamia where it picked up astrological elements, and then by the Hellen Hellenized uh, Magi on the Iranian diaspora in Anatolia, who added a Stoic cosmology and eschatology. With this theoretical framework, Kumul could use the recently translated Avesta and other Paglavi Zoroastrian texts to interpret the archaeological material and conveniently explain everything that did not fit the sources. This, of course, was most appropriate, for literature about the contents of the cult in the West was largely missing. As Richard Borden wrote in the article that contributed to Kumon's academic downfall in 1975, 
Camus harking back to Iranian sources, and I quote, was the outcome of his desire to create a religion, to dress up the pathetically dry bones of the Western evidence in a flesh compounded of Zoroastrian and Chaldean speculation. But notwithstanding the richness of the Duran Mutheum, it turned out to be a huge disappointment with respect to the quest for the origin of Mythos God. Notwithstanding its closeness to the Parthian border, even Primon had to admit that the decoration of the Mitraeum in its final phase was more or less in line with the Mitraea found elsewhere in the Roman Empire, and that the cult must have been come to Zura with the Roman army. Hence, instead of proof for the eastern origin of the cult, Dura became proof for its orthodoxy. For even as far east as Dura, the characteristics of the cult were in line with those found, found elsewhere in the empire. Although he tried to save some of his theory by reconstructing an early deviant eastern mythos cult uh, at uh, the site, the overall evidence was disappointingly low. This anticlimax probably partly explains why the final report of the Dura Mitraeum never materialized. And only preliminary report of the finest by Rostovsky and Timur were published. E.D. Francis tried to pick it up in the 70s of the last century, but his project was likewise never completed. He did, though, translate this re uh, the report that Timur had sent to Yale in 1947 and he published a very important article on the graffiti. Some years ago, Matthew McCarthy from the University of British Columbia and myself revived the project, and we intend to re-evaluate the excavation reports and finally publish, with the help of Jean-Baptiste Yon, the graffiti from the Mitraeum based on the cards and tracings made by Primont and Rostosse in the field that Matt found virtually complete in the archive of the Yale University Art Gallery. They were supposed to have been lost, but they're not. But that's good. Since the Dura Mitraeum was first published in the 30s and 40s of the last century, a lot has changed, both with respect to the ideas of Mitras in general, as well as Mitras in Syria, where several spectacular new discoveries were made. In my talk of today, I confine myself to the presumed relationship between this Mithraeum and Iran that has been an important theme from the moment of its discovery, and that, rather surprisingly, keeps popping up in the discussions. As with most things related to Mitra, ideas about the Iranian origin of the cult have also changed substantially over the past 50 years. The most strong theory on the cult's Iranian character was almost unanimously abolished in the 17th of the last century. This does not mean that, you know, that an alternative was found for his theory, nor that the origin of Mitras and the process of the possible transmission of the cult from east to west is resolved now. Far from it. Although scholars advocating a strong connection between Iran and the Roman god have become uncommon, rare, there are still many theories looking for a weaker connection, uh, in which people look for an intermediate stage, frequently in Asia Minor or Anatolia, and a reinterpretation and further development of the cult in the West. On the other hand, quite a few scholars of imperial Roman religion now argue that the connection is very weak indeed and that the cult is largely a Roman reinvention, a selection and manipulation of foreign elements that, laid, that catered the search for oriental wisdom that was in vogue at the time. This approach was recently strengthened by the introduction of the notion of Persianism, an extension of what Roger Beck in the 70s already called Persianism. The latter approach is no doubt the strongest now. And yet, there are still scholars looking for an Iranian connection. In addition to historians with a background in Iranian studies, such as Tommaso Pannoni, the voice of Richard Warden is particularly strong here, and this is quite surprising since he was among the scholars that dethroned Pannoni. 
And so I return today to the question whether in Dura the cult was more or less Iranian than elsewhere in the Roman world. And if so, how come? Before we look into the two main arguments for additional Iranian influence in Dura, I'd first like to dwell on the two main, two main reasons that caused the discussion to flare up again. The discovery of a spectacular new flame in Syria that testifies to influences from Iran and Dura's location on the Roman Parthian border, an aspect that enjoys a revival because of the recent stress on local characteristics and personal creativity in the cult. Important for the revived interest in Iranian influence in Syria are several newly discovered new flea uh, in Syria and Phoenicia, in particular the spectacular Mithraeum that was discovered in 1997 below the 5th century church of Photius in Duarte, close to Apamea. In this richly decorated museum, with paintings dating from the second half of the 4th century, we find a number of narrative scenes and iconographical motifs that are unique in Mithraic art. There is no time um, to discuss the Mithraeum in detail, but it's clear that scenes such as this one, picturing a city wall with monstrous heads on top, involve a juxtap uh, juxtaposition of good and evil forces, meaning that for the first time in Mithraic iconography in the West, we find the dualism that is characteristic of Zoroastrianism as we know it, but that was apparently absent in the Roman cult. But what are we to make of this? So far, a number of theories have been proposed. Scholars like Gordon and Broly hint at Zoroastrian influences, arguing that culturally and religiously speaking, the border with the Sasanian Empire was an open one. This is true, but I fail to see the explicitly Zoroastrian element here, and I see no similarities with Mir as worshipped in Parthia or Sasanian Iran. Mikhail Gavrikovsky opted for a locally developed dualism, whereas I myself have argued for many cave influence. My main arguments are the similarity between several of the paintings and Middle Persian text, as well as the fact that we know that Manu used picture books to spread his faith, a missionary effort that is known to have been very successful in Syria in the fourth century AD. Since Manichaeism is to be distinguished from Zoroastrianism, we are dealing here with quite another instance of Iranian influence. Be it as it may, given the late date of the monument, this instance of cultural and religious interaction cannot be used to clarify the origins of Roman Mitha. What this monument does show is how open-minded and potentially creative such small Mithraic communities could be. Therefore, later influences from the East are certainly a possibility we have to reckon with in this region. This brings me to the second reason frequently offered for the revival of Iranian influence, the proximity of Syria and the Europos to the Roman Parthian border. At first sight, this makes perfect sense, especially since it becomes fashionable to speak of this border region, region between the two empires as a frontier zone with a hybrid culture that is sharing certain characteristics. But there are several important caveats to be made here. First, the idea of a shared hybrid frontier culture also implies that elements deriving from one of the two main cultures do not necessarily refer to these cultures anymore, but they may simply be considered expressions of a local or regional identity. A telling example is the so-called Parthian male costume that is fashionable in, for example, Palmyra, Dura Europos, and Edessa. To see this expression of Iranian cultural influence as a manifestation of an Iranian <coughs> identity, definitely pushes the evidence too far. 
if anything, it expresses a local identity. And this local identity does not necessarily has anything to do with the Arsacid or Sassanian Empire. This has, of course, important repercussions for the connotation and attraction of Persian elements in the cult of Mitras in Dura. As mentioned above, as I, as I said before, such Persian elements, whether real or imaginary, were possibly one of the main attractions of the cult in the West. But these fairy motives must have been far less exotic in a dream context. And they should be understood in this local context in order to establish their pool and meaning. Second, we must reckon with the possibility that the devil may be the real detail. As Peter Boer has pointed out in his well known study upon the cultural hybridity, border regions sharing the same hybrid culture sometimes also display subtle differences that may have important repercussions. Not surprisingly, this is particularly true in times of conflict. For example, Burke points to more or less identical stories that are being told on both sides of the border, but in which main protagonists differ according to the party telling these stories. So this necessarily implies that the historical context has to be taken into account. And frequently, we do not have such detailed information for the period we are studying. But in the case of Dura, we are fortunate to know that the clientele of this Mithraeum was made up entirely of soldiers serving in the Roman army. We furthermore know that from 220 onwards, when the Sasanian dynasty took over from the Arsacids, the tensions along this frontier intensified dramatically. For the soldiers who used this mitraeum, Persia was not some far away exotic entity, but a clear and present danger. Given this situation, we may ask which Persia the cult is referring to. That of the contemporary Parthian or Sasanian empires, or a Persia from a distant past that had been changed into a Roman cult and had grown into something very different from what was happening across the border. Finally, when looking for influence, we should not only pay attention to the context, but we should also try to compare like with like. So we, when we look for Iranian influences in the cult of Mithras and Dura, we should try to look for historical examples from the Iranian world that are as close in time as possible. And instead of taking our recourse to a rush that was written down centuries later, and that suggests continuity in the cult's character, uh, that this cult simply did not have. This having said, let us return to the instances that the Dura Mitraeum, in the Dura Mitraeum that are traditionally cited to illustrate Iranian influence. The paintings of the so-called magicians, uh, and the paintings of the mountain archer Mithras hunting animals. Both date from the final decoration phase of the century that is to be dated somewhere between 220 and 250, and that the excavators considered to be the predominantly Roman, apart from these two uh, topics. On either side of the piers of the cold niche, with the well-known toroctony, two male figures sit on an elaborate high-backed thrones. Both are bearded, display portrait-like characteristics, and are dressed in long sleeved tunics, mantle, trousers, soft shoes, and Phrygian bonnets. Um, in their right hand, they hold a black cane with flat formal and tapered point that is pointing upward with the figure on the right hand side and downward with the figure on the left. In their left hand is a scroll. They are unique to the iconography of Dura and they are not identified by an inscription. Based upon their Persian clothing, scroll and cane, Rostovsev and Kimon identified them as Marjijan, 
I just cannot sort of pronounce this word. <laughs> this is really just horrid. Um, but you know what I mean. Um, with Cumont suggesting that they are infected to prophets, Mithraism, Zoroaster, and Ostalis. Richard Borden recently repeated the identification of Magians, adding that Magians are mentioned twice in the Duryodhana Graffiti. The Magians were, of course, the official priests of the Ecumenic kings, and under the Parthians and Sasanians, the term is used for Zoroastrian priests. They are also well known in classical sources on Ecumenic Persia and Hellenistic Anatolia. The title is mentioned nowhere else in a Mithraic context, and Gordon therefore concludes that awareness of the cult's Iranian heritage was particularly intense in Dura. Let me start with the two graffiti. The first graffito in Greek reads Turoton asma tota maigois kenitron posidon. That's probably to be translated as a fiery, um, fiery, fiery breath, which is indeed for Magians for the purification of holy ones. It recalls the line from the Santa Prisca in Rome that refers to the purification of the speakers by lions, who perhaps represent fire, and is possibly also a verse from a hymn. Another Magian is mentioned in a Nama inscription as one of the very few an inscription in Latin that's most remarkable, and it is the grade, the function, or the role of a certain Maximus. All in all, this gives us very little to go on. All we can say is that uh, a, a margin may have been a, a function, role, or a grade in the Dura community, and that it was attached to a person with a Roman name, so probably it was not completely released. Ostostov suggested it may have been a priestly title or a title for the pater, but this is bound, bound to, to remain speculation. In any case, no pater from Dura has, has the name of Maximus, or so far as we know. There can be no doubt that the, the title, uh, Margin, has a Persian origin, but we have no way of knowing how it was interpreted in Dura and the relationship with the two painted figures is most in the unlike, as I have pointed out in several publications. Not only are margins unaccounted for in Hebraic <coughs> iconography, but as far as can be told from representations of Magians dated to the Ecumenate, Hellenistic, and Parthian periods. These two figures do not look like Magians at all. They are not dressed in white, but they wear the so-called white costume. The, that is rather common in the cities in the Syrian Mesopotamian desert. They wear a Phrygian bonnet instead of the usual high turban, and they hold a stick instead of a parcel. In fact, the Phrygian caps are typical of later representations of Magians in the West, but they have nothing to do with the actual headdress of this official as known from historical sources. At best, therefore, these are Western representations of Magians. <laughs> but such an interpretation is far-fetched since clothing and headdress of both men is obviously very similar to that worn by Mithras himself in the Doris paintings. In turn, Mithras' outfit is identical to the way his companions, companions Countess and Patopetes, are dressed. Interestingly, it follows from older layers of the cluster that the two bearded men replaced figures of Countess and Patopetes. And in addition to their clothing, their upward and downward pointed sticks also recall the torches of Mithras' helper. However, the bearded faces and individual features exclude such an identification. Alternatively, we may identify both men but as fathers of the community. For throughout the Roman Empire, 
the Phrygian bonnet is also the specific attribute of the pattern, who in several contexts acts like a substitute for Mithras himself. In Dura too, this headdress <coughs> must have been one of the distinguishing features of the coat. Whereas, Parth whereas Parthian tunic and trousers are common in Dura, the Phrygian bonnet is not part of the daily costume, and it stands out as one of the characteristics, uh, characteristic attributes of the cult and his associates. The prominent position of the two painted figures is in line with the elevated status of the patres that is expressed in numerous dedications across the empire. The black cane carried by the two unique figures highlights their authoritative position for its problem to be identified as a vitis, the staff that was the symbol of the authority and power of the centurionate. So a military attribute, which is quite understandable in the context of this military community. The scroll also seems to be the usual attribute of the father Verdura, for it's attested with a portrait of a man with a Phrygian cap that once decorated the walls of the sanctuary. And we also know from inscriptions found in the <coughs> that in the material, that there were indeed two patres at the same time in Buddha. So in all likelihood, the two portraits commemorate two very important fathers of the community. Although the representations are unique to Dura, they fit in very well with what we know about the appearance and position of fathers elsewhere in the trade groups in the Roman Empire, and so these paintings do not testify to a strong Iranian connection. The second instance, frequently cited as testimony of Iranian influence, are two paintings on the side walls of the Abitur on either side of the tall reliefs, picturing a figure in Parthian dress on horseback hunting animals. The painting on the left wall is best preserved. The figure gallops towards the Kopnish and aims his bow at the four deer and the boar that have all been hit by his arrows. Below the horse is a large snake and a female lion leaps just in front. Since neither of them is hit by an arrow, they are probably companions of the rider. The horseman faces full front, whereas his body is in three quarter view, and on his head there's a Phrygian bonnet, and he wears a long sleeve tunic and trousers decorated with an embroidered band. The hunting takes place in a field of small plants and trees. The painting to the left of the coat mesh is far more damaged, but what remains indicates that it was very similar to its counterpart on the other side of the mesh. This horseman is moving away from the niche, as are the animals that he is hunting. Among these were at least three deer that have all been hit by the hunter's arrow. The status of the adult lion that runs in front of the horse is not clear, but the lion club cup replaces the snake below the horse, uh, and the boar is missing. Now, really took a while before I sort of realized that um, these are basically Mitra is here sort of riding in circles. So he's going up to the Kultnish and on the other side he's going away from it. And the reason that you don't realize is that if you make a picture he's going the same way. So you really have to be on the spot to, to notice it. And I'm quite convinced that this must have a ritual meaning attached uh, to it. I won't go into it because I concentrate on the Iranian influence. Now, it has been interpreted as Iranian influence because mounted archers were proverbial for Persia in antiquity. But although the representations of two riders is confined to the Mithraea in Dura and in Uatta, we do find several instances uh, of Mithras acting as a mounted hunter in Mithraea in the Roman West notably in Germania. Admittedly, all these images differ slightly amongst themselves, but it is clear that throughout the empire, the bow is an attribute characteristic of Mithras that typifies him 
as a hunter of animals. As such, the bow is also connected with the killing of the bull that is likewise the outcome <laughs> of a chase or a hunt. So it's not an ordinary sacrifice. We are calling it a sacrifice all the time. But it's not an ordinary sacrifice. It's the end uh, of a hunt. It ends in an extraordinary way, but with it a hunt nevertheless. So this explains the small, uh, this is to be seen in the small narrative scenes that uh, accompany the main scene. And uh, it also explains the instances in which this weapon, the bow, is represented in the background of the Toroptony, as in this recently discovered uh, Toroptony from Bay uh, in its city. <coughs> Whereas uh, the bow and the hunting of animals are well integrated in the Mitra's uh, iconography throughout the empire, the paintings from Dura are difficult to reconcile with Iranian religious notions. First, Mitra's as a hunting Rider God is of minor importance in Parthian and Sasanian traditions of the God. And here I'm sort of saying, like, I think what I say is right. I'm so sort of scared by your Sophian uh, image of the, the rider Mitra. Second, the animals that figure in the painting of this Hamlet in Dura are very difficult to reconcile with the rest of beliefs. The two animal companions of the God, the snake and the lion, are considered defiled animals in the Zoroastrian world. Whereas the boar, one of the animals that's being hit by one of the arrows, frequently figures the manifestation of Viraprachna. The choice for the mount mounted bowmen in Dura is therefore best explained from a combination of global, local, and regional traditions that do not necessarily point towards Iraq. Hunting scenes similar to this one are well known in Dura especially in a Palmyrene context, such as this painting that was found in the Iwam of a private house and dates to 192. Clearly, the motive has nothing to do with Persia, but it illustrates a popular past time of the owner. And a rider similarly dressed to Mitras is known from a dipinto from the temple of Azanatkona, used as the head office of the 20th Palmyrene cohort who also used the Mithraeum. Like the Mithraeum, this Dipinto originates in a military context, and it shows that the motive of the rider is perfectly understandable in a context in which at least part of the clientele was using horses professionally. I conclude. The two motives that have been quoted time and again as evidence for additional Iranian influence in Dura are better understood in the context of the Roman cult of the god that is interpreted in Dura in a way that conforms with local culture, cultural circumstances, and the social conditions and religious backgrounds of its use. In my view, contemporary Iranian influences are quite unlikely in a context of military threat and conflict. So, were the Iranian connotations less here than elsewhere in the Roman Empire? I doubt it, although much of what looked exotic in the West was rather common in Dura's cultural context. But we do find many Nama inscriptions in this shrine, and also the grave of, per of Perthes is attested. However, Mithras and his acolytes do not look like Parthian or Sasanian here, and typical Parthian or Sasanian iconographic motives are missing. Most intriguing is the Phrygian cap that, as I noted, was not normally worn by Dura's inhabitants, nor is it associated with Parthian or Sasanian kings. It is perhaps telling that in a famous and contemporary painting from the nearby synagogue, the Achaemenid king and the figure of Mordecai on his white horse, very similar to Mitra's horse, are both depicting wearing a Phrygian cap. I therefore conclude that in Dura, Mitras's coat was first and foremost a Roman coat, in line with what 
with what was common throughout the Roman Empire, referring to a Persia from a long gone era. Thank you. Thank you. But surprisingly to you, I have some questions. <laughs> first, first, I I will uh, uh, I basically agree with your uh, dismissal of the hunting scene as uh, uh, specifically well, uh, well it's, it's a complicated issue. Um, uh, for a long time, as others, I thought the, the white ball running in front of of the rider could be a very rare reference to knowledge of the Mihriasht because the white boar appears in the mm. But now I, I, I realize the, the white boar is a catch, is hidden by arrows. Yes. This one does not does not shoot as at his own at his own associates. Right. Yes. Uh, but uh, the dossier of the hunt the hunting Mithra in Iran um might have some titles well uh, the the image I, uh, the sarcophagus of Yu Hong in china is, is not a hunting myth he's riding he's mm -hmm. not hunting. Uh, we are we have the uh, we have a strange story told by tacitus about the god in mount sambulos mm -hmm. uh, who is anonymous you know the story uh, they, they release horses and uh, in the uh, priest with his horses and in the morning they find the animals killed by arrows yeah. so they assume the uh, the horse has been ridden by a god during the night a hunting god uh, what well, Mithra is a possible candidate uh, it, it would be a, the only real attestation of Mithra hunter in Iran uh, but it is not actually the only candidate because um, we have another arch we have an, another archer god in Iran, who moreover uh, is sometimes represented by a horse, and moreover he protects the hunt. It's Tishtria, okay. the god of the star series. So Misra is the the, the, uh, the the story at Mount Sambulos is not a straightforward evidence for Mithra hunter in Iran. Uh, I have a question about the attribute held by uh, the two gentlemen gentlemen mm -hmm. are holding the left hand yes is it as, as I, I, I remember it's sometimes described as, as scrolls yes this is that this is this is actually interesting mm -hmm. because what can these scrolls be uh, usually they are considered as sacred texts used for liturgy etc it could be something else mm -hmm. uh, I have two examples that for, from Iran and Central, Central Asia, I know, but there might be examples in the Roman world. Uh, in uh, in Kuwajja, the Zoroastrian temple in Iran, and in Surkota, the royal temple in Ebatria, uh, in both cases, the the, the, the donors, the the the, 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 don, the, the, uh, the patrons of the temple, held a scroll. Uh, in uh, in uh, Sirkota, it is the Kushan King. It actually holds a, a, a register. In Kuehwaja, it's a scroll, and this is a, a local couple of benefactors. In this case, as Avestan liturgy was oral at that time, it's more likely to be interpreted as acts of donation. Mm -hmm. yes. And I wonder whether these two patres, they are patres, which is very probable, I could not so. be represented in the role of patrons of the of the Mithraia, which means that uh, the scrolls might contain an act an endowment they were they were uh, depicted here in a place of honor because they had paid mm -hmm. for the reconstruction yes well that's a very interesting suggestion especially since well we didn't talk about that but that's two uh cult reliefs, reliefs. Well, actually, actually, it's two votive reliefs um, um, that function as cult reliefs in the final Mithraeum. Um, and they were dedicated only like one or two years, one after the other. Uh, and uh, that's quite strange. 
So it's, and both were uh, um, donated by the strategos of the Belmarine archers. Hmm. So I've, so I've, tr I've, I always wanted them to be <laughs> the, the, the important founders, also because these reliefs are still so prominently exposed, even in the final phase of the century, and it would accord very well with this sort of almost like mythical status of but people of like five. It doesn't, it's species. not contradictory with the idea that they could be, uh, uh, they, that they could uh, have detached receiving an important part of the church. No, I think it's they it's, could bestow this honor to people who, uh, 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 who uh, on the other side, were benefactors. Yes, no, definitely. But it's because, a very. Uh, we have that in uh, we have that in the inscription of Cartier in Iran mm -hmm. when he mentions him founding fire temples here and there. He writes many, many, uh, many documents, charters were, were, were drawn and sealed at that time. Sealed. It means that the order was written. Yeah. Oh, it's clear that here too, uh, the members must have been important for this community and mm -hmm. that they became part of its history. Mm -hmm. And you see that here with these uh, founders, donors, patres. Uh, but also we have portraits that decorate the walls century and it's interesting they were all made in different styles so it mm. sort of seems that they were made like uh, every time something important happened yeah. by different people so it's it seems the most like, important thing which could happen yeah. was money yeah money yes probably money <laughs> <laughs> and and, oh. and so uh, but they sort of constitute like the 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 total of the uh, mithraic community yeah. so the people that are painted are also present when the other people are living people are present so it becomes like a yes like like a very tight knit community that's also expressed in its decoration that is playing a part in this but thank you very much for the suggestion i will uh, definitely look up these uh, parallels other questions Okay, well, if not, please join me in thanking both of our speakers from this afternoon's panel. I believe now we have a coffee break. I have a moving paper uh, in the uh, Arsene Terms about the Japanese yes. school of okay. which I, I interpret already, already, but I had a lost paper. Your painting so I don't need to go. Yeah, we'll take a longer break so we won't come again. It is a royal couple of the government. Yes, and the royal is crooked. It holds a scrub. And when the inside is copied, it's somewhere other stupid things. When he copied, he wrote, he scribbled all those details of the scrub, something I was unable to read. So when I saw the native German speaking of the it's a donation. Like Byzantine mistakes, we don't have the, when you have the emperor uh, showing the, 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 the miniature model of the church, and, so, but they could at the same time they had a liturgical function for coast. This is a honor. It is a honor which was bestowed not on the religious capacities.
for a language independent of reported Persian origin. This later view often considers rewrite iconography and its visual language as fixed symbol, referring to consistent and homogeneous iconography and its visual language as fixed symbol, referring to con sorry as fixed symbol and um, as a fixed symbol and interpretation found throughout the empire. A good example of this view is Beck's reading of the Mitraite iconography as a star map. One recent account has even posited the cult's uh, mystery was the salvific power of Rome's first emperor, Emperor Augustus. More recently, however, a scholar has begun to recognize the variability of Mitraite imagery and have stressed the initiate role as active, active agent in transferring cultic knowledge <coughs> and Mitraite worship in the Roman Empire as a particular form of social consumption. This approach explored the Mitraite communities as social networks established inside and beyond the sanctuary called Mitraia, where initiate, perform rituals and learn, share, exchange their cultic knowledge. Apart from different lenses, these approaches take to interpret the Roman cults of Mitras, its art and ritual language. They more or less agree on the constant cultic imagery portraying the deity, more precisely, the cultic imagery of Mitras per se, in the Persian look and oriental dress, meaning a slip tonic, the median canvas, trousers, anaxorites, and Phrygian yak tiara over his curly hair. Very recently, Richard Gordon suggested the notion of Persianism to explain the Greco-Roman appropriation of the Persian god Mitra. For him, Persianism is the process whereby Roman Mitraite Misagoges appropriated their knowledge about the Iranian Mitra from external sources and transformed this data into Mitraite iconography and ritual language to validate the Iranian origin of their god, both in name and visuality or visual. Following Gordon, this research explored the Greek historiography of the Iranian religion on the one hand and the Greek topoi of Persian on the other hand as the sources that transmitted a figure of the Iranian Mitra to the Roman Empire. I suggest that the external sources referred to by Gordon were not just random sources available to the Roman Mitraists, but were the Greek construction and characterization of the Persians, their religion and culture that identified the Iranian Mitra as the counterpart of Apollo and Hellenes, and characterized the Persians as handsome Oriental, expert in horse riding and archery. Moreover, the Roman Mitra's reception of the Iranian Mitra, or what Gordon understands as Persianism in the context of Roman Mitraism, was not just a simple selection or reception of others' tradition, or in this case, from the Persian traditions. Rather, it was a deliberate choice and a conscious cultural borrowing on the side of Romans, fulfilling Rome's demand for self-imagery and her desire for fluidity and openness to others. I will commence my discussion with a brief review of the Roman imagery of the god, for instance, what kind of iconography <coughs> did the Roman use to depict their god. Following this, I turn to those sources which possibly uh, built such a visualization of the god in the mind of Romans, or more precisely, in the minds of initiates. I am to discover the external sources, as referred to by Gordon. So here I have an example from the Netherheim Mitraeum. In Netherheim, we have four Mitraeum, it's one of those. Uh, showing the god sitting on the bow, uh, controlling the animal which, uh, with his right foot and left hand and slaying him with a dagger in his right hand. The gesture is typically Nike's gesture as we are aware. 
Mitros is dressed in canvas and an accessory desk with a fluttering mantle on his shoulder. He has curly hair and wears a Phrygian cap. As usual, the image is decorated with miniature scenes narrating some stories about Mitros' life and miracles, his attendants such as Cautus and Cautopatus, or the reclining figure could be Jupiter or Serapis, and initiate ritual or initiation rituals and initiates. Another example is the Tauroctony of the Mitraeum at Marion, Italy. Here you see a better scene, a covered scene that is more embellished and fan fancier, like it's a kind of fancy fancy Tauroctony. Again, the same story and quality narrative. This imagery of the god attracts even more attention in the scenes showing the god's encounter with Sol and Luna, usually depicted, like Sol and Luna, usually depicted in the Greek and Roman style, nude or with a shoulder cape. Here I have an example for you. <coughs> I have a well known Mitraic relief showing Sol and Mitras in the first after the bull sacrifice. As you see, Sol is nude with a uh, radiant nimbus over his head, and Mitras is dressed in a Phrygian cap uh, and a mantle. Alternatively, another Mitraic relief showing the god in combat, combat and then reconciliation, wearing their typically attributed clothing. You see, Sol and Mitras. Contextualized in the observable localized varieties in Mitraic art and ritual language, the symbol used by Roman Mitraics can vary from one place to another. Yet, it seems the god's iconography remains steady and unchanged, and the major differences only relate to the experts of the artist in creating a fine artifact, wall painting, or carved stone. I have here the Mitraic relief of the third Mitraeum in Nederheim, at Nida, representing the god in the same dress but with a muscular body and muscles. As you see again, the god dressed in a long sleeve tonic with a pleated skirt but without too many details and decoration. Another, another one, Mitra's portrait in the Mitraic, uh, Mitraic uh, Tauroctony of Santa Prisco, perhaps not quite the nicest image we can find. However, in the case of other characters of the Mitraic Tauroctony, we observe more flexibility in accordance with the local temp. A good example is a wall painting from Dora Mitraeum. It's just discussed by Dr. Thurman. Portraying the gods in a similar garment but different crowns. While Mitras has his usual Phrygian cap on top of his curly hair, the deity soul appears with a halo around his face. Only two instances of the god are known for depicting Mitras in a different style. We have only two different examples. One, is the standing figure of Mitras slaying the bull in the Mitraeum at the Battle of Mitras in Austria? which depicts a god with a muscular body dressed in a sheeton, a belt around his waist, like a typical Greek iconography. The other one is the coin of Tarsus issue under Guardianus III is the, other, uh, is the other evidence showing Mitra nude with a pleated skirt and a dagger in his raised hand. He has a crown over his head. Though, I believe this deity is not the Roman Mitras. It's likely the Greek Nike is slaying the bull to celebrate the king's victory. However, there is just a minor point I would like to emphasize about the Celtic iconography of the god, which characterizes Mitras as heterogeneous, already mentioned and discussed by Dr. Yanni. They, the useful Mitras, rising from a stone with curly hair or a Phrygian <laughs> cap, and holding a dagger and a torch in his hand. There is an entire another discussion I could have about this imagery, but this is neither the time nor the place. Turning back to our discussion at hand, as I mentioned earlier, the Roman iconography of Mitras evokes the Greek imagery of the handsome, or, uh, handsome oriental. Here, I borrow Rolf Schneider's words to say that the handsome oriental is distinguished by useful beauty, rich dress, and intensive colors. You saw it in the case of Mitra, uh, Mitra Grilin at Maya. Like the, Mitra the Roman imagery shows that Eastern custom acquired more prestige in the middle and late Republican period at the um, period 
and the Romans used Oriental dress to represent the Parthians and Trojans. A good example of that is the statue of Augustus in the Villa of Livia Augusta at Prima Porta with an image of a Parthian with a long beard and curly hair dressed in a long sleeve tunic and trousers with flat shoes on the emperor's side. Curly hair dressed in um, uh, this imagery reflects the typical Greek image of the handsome Oriental with Persian headgear, tunic, trouser, and footgear that the Romans used to depict Parthian ethnicity, which differentiate the real Parthian figures from the handsome Oriental with shaved faces. This imagery in, uh, is indeed traced to the Greek historiography and visualization of the Persians. In Herodotus histories, they read, the men who served in the army were the following persons. The Persians, for their equipment, they wore on their heads loose caps called tiaras, and on their bodies sleeve tonics of diverse colors, with a scale of iron light in the appearance <coughs> of the scale of fish, and breeches on their legs. Similarly, a straw described the Persians as the successors of the Medes and states their clothing, being composed of tiara, sitaris, pelas, tonics with the sleeve reaching to the hand, and trousers are indeed suitable things to wear in cold regions. Now, the question arises as to why the Roman Mitraeus were enthusiastic about depicting their god as a handsome oriental. One asked whether they had a clear idea about the Iranian provenance of their god, indeed, The Roman imagery of Mitras shares little to nothing with the Zoroastrian Mitra at the aesthetic level and nor at the level of iconography. He is not the sleepless Avestan triotor with the 10,000 eyes and a thousand ears. He does not traverse the air in a company of the sun to judge the deeds of people noon. He is not even the supervisor of ocean contracts. The Roman Mitras appears as an anthropopathic anthropomorphic figure similar to other Greek and Roman deities, frozen in the same slaying gesture as Nike, yet with a more oriental appearance. Nevertheless, such a cultic iconography asserts that the Roman Mitraeus had a clear vision of their god's Iranian origin. They even desire to stress the dispressive foreign, more precisely non-Roman origin of their deity by a cultic iconography. Yet, Roman initiate of the Mitraic cult had no clear idea about the Zoroastrian character and nature of their god. Indeed, what they knew about their god was perhaps limited to his name and Iranian provenance that was transmitted to them by a Greek iconography and historiography of Persians, their culture, and religions, which identified the Iranian Mitra as the counterpart of Helios and Apollo. Rather than the Zoroastrian, or more carefully, Iranian Mitra, the Roman iconography of the god evoked the hybrid deity Apollo Mitras Helios Hermes at number five, and the Greek identification of Mitras as the Persian Helios. One of the earliest sources identifying the Persian Mitra with Helios, the Greek sun god, was Strabo's geography. As we read, or sorry, or read, now the Persians do not erect a statue or altar, but offer sacrifice on a high place regarding the humans as Zeus, and they also worship Halius, whom they call Mitras, and Selene, and Aphrodite, and fire, and earth, and wind, and water. Thus, the Iranian Mitra is passed down as the Iranian Persian counterpart of Helios, as Greeks identifying Abraham Mazda with Zeus. Again, Holds the pattern that we see and we find at Nimrud Gabri, Zeus Omadis, Apollo Mitras Helios Hermes. In the Sphintian oration to Apollo, Mitras is the Persian name of Apollo. As Mitras, the Persian address you, as Horus the Egyptian, as Dionysus the Thebans, the people of Delphi honor you with a double name, Apollo and Dionysus. The text probably dates back to pre-Hellenistic time. 
The Roman astronomer Ptolemy goes further and states that Christians, alongside other inhabitants of the southern part of the greater uh, of Greater Asia, revered the star of Saturn under the name of Mitra Pallius. So just to save time, I read this the last part. And the last sentence. For they revered the star of Venus under the name of Isis and that of Zotron as Mitras Helios. Nevertheless, there is imagery and embodiment that predates Ptolemy reading of the Iranian Mitra, the hybrid deity of the Mitras Helios sons. However, I'm trying to show that while the worship of Roman Mitras was created and reached its zenith in the Roman Empire, particularly in the second and third century CE, the origin and character of the god was already articulated years earlier by the Greeks. To be specific, I'm referring to deity, not the cult, not the cult. Though these sources and their characterization of the god may partly affect the ritual language of the cult. In any event, the Greek identification of the Iranian Mitra as the equivalent of the Greek gods Apollo and Helios reflects an interpretatio graeca, a process of rendering foreign religions and cultures logical to the Greek worldview and the structure familiar to the Greeks both literally and conceptually. The Greek image of the Iranian Mitra represented a cultural adaptation of a foreign god for Greek audiences rather than a faithful rendering of a foreign god. In this sense, the Iranian god Mitra is understood to be the sun and the Iranian equivalent of the Greek sun god Helios. Returning to Gordon, if we should see the Roman Catholic iconography of Mitra as a form of Persianism, I would like to read it as a Hellenistic Persianism. Seeing themselves as the inheritor of Greek historiography, philosophy, and all other dimensions of Greek intellectuality and culture, the Romans borrowed the Greek imagery of the handsome Oriental to stress the Iranian provenance of Mitras that was narrated and transmitted to them via their Greek represent via their Greek intellectual ancestors. The Roman Mitraic iconography is a Greek collage visual language representing the initiate acquaintance with the Hellenistic Iranian Mitra. More precisely, I use the term Hellenistic to refer to the Greeks' rendering, identification, and characterization of the Iranian deity. In this sense, the Roman Mitras embraced and borrowed a part of Iranian tradition that was created or reproduced by the Greeks. To conclude, One may ask why the Roman Mitraists were motivated to create a novel visual language and show their god as the hands from Oriental. Why might Persianists have appealed to the military men and craft people who became initiate of the cult? Here I briefly suggest two possible scenarios. First, the reception and appropriation of the Iranian Mitra could add to the long list of Roman deities, provide answers to their da uh, daily needs and open up a salvific solution for their afterlife. The Roman Mitraists gathered in Mitraia to, Im uh, to imitate the cultic narrative, experience the gods Epiphany, and guarantee their redemption in their afterlife. However, Mitras was never widely embraced as a Roman deity. Mystic and powerful, yes, yet Mitras always remain a non-Roman deity with an oriental appearance de developed and stressed by separative initiates. Rather than giving a new order to the Roman cosmos or answer a need in their cosmological views, the Roman Mitras was perceived as a non-Roman deity whose veneration required esoteric knowledge which could be obtained only by initiating the cult and the cultic communities. In other words, the Roman military and craftsmen had more accessible options if their concern was salvation in the afterlife. Thus, another reason must have prompted certain Romans to worship a deity of another origin. Perhaps, as evidenced by the cultic iconography, Mitra's otherness and his other appearance perform an essential role in the Mitra's world view. Mitra's was a sacred alterite. He was 
consecrated otherness and prescience, the embodiment of a friendly foe and desirable enemy whom the Romans encountered in their movement and cultural interaction, uh, military movement and cultural interactions. What should be stressed was, uh, was the non-Roman appearance, a deity dressed in the oriental garment with an occidental gaze. Rather than answering the cosmological need and order, the Roman, the Roman mitras was a worldly answer to the Romans' need and appeal for othering and their political cultural alteration of Iranians. This othering discourse could serve the Romans at two levels. First, at the level of self-imagery, since the self is articulated vis a vis other. Basically, you define, a, you um, identify yourself through the difference with others. That is why the role of human agent as active beings was essential in creating and developing the Roman Mitri cult. Roman Mitraism was not the result of random appropriation, but rather a deliberate choice and conscious borrowing. And to note, at this level, the esoteric knowledge attributed to the Mitraic community and ritual could make small communities of Roman elite. Going one step further, we have the Roman Empire's need for openness to and tolerance of other cultural and ethnicities to control sociocultural diversities in her territories and borders and guarantee her imperial claim. Of course, as his nature as a god demands, the sacred essence of Mitras should be venerated in the form of a religious system. What can you do with a sacred thing other than worshiping King of Heaven? Thank you very much. I have a question about uh, another unquestionably Iranian name <laughs> attested in, this, in the Roman Mithraic epigraphy. It is Arimanius. Yeah. It has been, uh, it has really been a problem for a while because it's associated with a uh, uh, kind of a devilish figure with a with a, with a lion head. With a dog's head and snake, etc. Yeah, lion head. Uh, so uh, sometimes it has been uh, perceived as a, a, a true, a true evidence that the Roman Mithraists had access, had a knowledge of Iranian dualism. My own perception. Is maybe wrong, but it's different. I think that Arimanius is just a translation. So uh, there are uh, it's a, these were dedication to Hades mm -hmm. and uh, as god of the of the underworld, not <coughs> necessarily not not as a not as a, not not as a, as an anti god god of the underworld. And they knew they knew that simply. The Iranians call Hades Ahriman. Mm -hmm. And this was a way to, 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 to give to Hades a kind of Iranian level, but no more. Uh, do you have do you have your own opinion on this question? Um, to be honest, um, with you, I guess um, the main idea for um, in, or like considering uh, their um, interpretation and their understanding of this figure as an Ahriman, uh, like uh, return to a Plutarch description of um, Mitra as a mediator and then the fight between Aura Mazda and Ahriman. But recent uh, interpretation and recent um, like research uh, tell us um, about uh, the, the strong middle platonic tone of Plutarch descriptions. And um, so right now people um, think, or like a scholar think, um, they, or in this specific case, Plotard, use this, um, com like this um, description for propagating his own idea on um, middle platonic propaganda. Uh -huh. You know, like showing the intellectual muscles to others that I know something uh -huh. exotic about like another tradition. Um, and 
it has really nothing to do um, clearly, directly with uh, the ritual of uh, Roman Mitras, or like or what's what's happening in the like Mitraya. Mm -hmm. You, you know what I mean? So I, yeah. I don't think that it it there is a really direct uh, link between yeah. this figure it's an and artificial the artificial level, yes, exotic leveling yes, exactly. to a concept which is different. Yeah, basically. exactly. Because um, during this time, like using the uh, like the um, um, some, like the Iranian philosophy, Iranian religion, like using this uh, exotic conversation for, for, for like propagating the Middle and Neoplatonic, um, like propaganda was really important. Like the, not only in the case of Plutarch, we have like Porphyry, we have uh, Platonius, you know, like it's a, like or like we have um, Oregon. It's like in, it's a phenomenon that we know it. Um, so I don't think that it's really uh, clear. Yes. Yeah, it's it's really relates to that conversation. Yes. Yeah. 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 I want to know when the Greek or Roman when they adopted them, took that religion or cult, whatever they name it, to the West. Mm -hmm. How much they knew about the belief system of the Iranian metro. Ah. Uh, <laughs> because it's it really, to the... Yeah, it's really... Um, okay, to, to be honest, I, I try uh, to show this, um, mm -hmm. that it seems that they had almost no idea. Mm -hmm. Like, they um, had some um, construction by themselves, like um, a kind of rendering, uh, or like a kind of... Uh, um, Com comparing or like identification uh, between um, like the Greek deities and the Iranian deities, like to um, to explain, describe the system, the cultures, and the religion. But if you are asking, um, did they have a clear idea mm -hmm. about the real, or if you can call it the real, uh, like the Russian system or the Iranian, um, like? I, if I may, I prefer to say no. <laughs> no. Um, like their description um, has, um, like, it's far from the reality. Mm -hmm. It's far from what we know about the Zoroastrianism and the texts and the like. So they, they <coughs> really have a kind of construction mm -hmm. and more logical, more um, understandable uh, for the Greek minds. Yes. Just one remark. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed this paper. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to comment on uh, the, the deviant statue from Ostia. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very strange in me, but they found out that originally this was a statue for some of the yes. yes. So that yes. explains this, this funny dress. Uh, yes. Uh, to be honest, um, yeah, uh, for the second case, I mentioned it because it's already discussed and published. Uh, but for the first one, I didn't uh, do this because it's still like it's open the uh, debate. Uh, but um, yes, but I had to mention it um, just to show that these are the like the statue attributed to Mitras. We know it, but yeah, but thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, final uh, speaker for today. Uh, Greg Wolf is the Ronald J. Mellor Distinguished Professor of Ancient History at UCLA and the editor of the Journal of Roman Archaeology. He has published on various aspects of Roman culture and religious history, his most recent book being the collection Religion in the Roman Empire, which he co-edited. Uh, so, welcome. Thanks, everybody.
Well, thank you. Uh, like everybody else, I would like to begin by thanking the organisers, Taraj, Matt, and everybody else who's been involved in the background, organising travel, parking, slides and everything. Thank you very much. It's been a very smoothly run, a very enjoyable conference. I'd also like to thank all the other speakers who have already shown quite a lot of the slides you're about to see. Um, <laughs> but that, I think that probably just goes with Mithraic studies, doesn't it? So during the longer of repeated taroctonies, um, I invite you to, to think about the cognitive impact of repetitive viewing of similar images on worshippers. Well, that isn't the main point I want to make today. So, the story of Mithras, um, Mithraic studies rather, offers a microcosm of the history of religious studies in the Roman world in general, I think. At the beginning of the 20th century, the invention of Mithraism lay at the heart of a narrative of change, in which Oriental religions swept westwards into the Mediterranean world, rapidly replacing decadent and unsatisfactory ancient civic cults until they were themselves replaced by one of their own in the form of Christianity. This is the Kumal thesis. Um, there is a handout wandering around, and some of the things I mentioned are of it, but it's in no way essential to have the handouts. Franz Kumal's paradigm provides a template for a vast industry, which took about a century of scholarly work, culminating in a vast series, Etudes Preliminaires aux Religions Orientales de l'Empire Romain. Now, almost every element of that paradigm has now been refuted. Civic religions are now recognised as being uh, dynamic, and capable of mustering excitement and commitment, um, and even of offering views of the relationship between the individual to the cosmos, the phenomena that Kumal grouped together and now understood to have a wide range of geographical and chronological origins. Mysteries were in fact invented in the Aegean world, not by any Easterners. The help they offered seems to be focused on this worldly things much more than on than the otherworldly salvation. And although it's common enough for these new phenomena to gesture to point of origin <coughs> elsewhere, Anatolia, Egypt, Syria, Judea and Persia among them, they mostly bore little resemblance to the indigenous traditions of those countries. Their appeals, each, that's to say each of these different groups of religions appeal to different sectors of the population of the Roman world. A few, like the cult of Isis, Serapis and Hippocrates, or a Duke to Optimus Dolicanus, probably were disseminated by the diasporic populations or representatives of them, in, but in forms adapted to Greek and Roman norms or a combination of the two. But others, like the cult of Kibile, Mata Magna, are better described as appropriations, heavily modified and refitted to form a place in local systems and subject to local structures of authority. As for competition, it's very difficult to find any examples of individuals detached from one adherence to another, of converts from one, one quote religion to another quote religion. Um, I'm going to have difficulty with the scare quotes, aren't I? Um, a few allegations by Christian writers apart, these developments mostly happened independently of one another, nor did traditional cults seem under pressure. New deities quite often found a place inside what's been called by Andreas Bendley the open additive system. In some times and places, they're even occasionally co-opted into the public cults of local communities or in support of particular emperors. Uh, emperors have themselves sometimes have particular attachments, but the Roman state as a whole seems really rather relaxed, and what Kumar had imagined was a vast takeover by alien religions. So that's, that's my short account of everything that happened in the early Roman religion. Uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is laid out here. I get to, first of all, Talk about how we might reimagine the place of Mithras in a world that had no religions in it. Then I want to skew to pass very rapidly over the main kinds of evidence from Mithras we have in Western lands. And I'll do this really because I want to show the structure of the evidence. And then I'll come on to looking at some further implications. So my brief state of the question, I hope, is completely uncontroversial. I think it is from what I've heard so far. Most elements of that critique were in place before the end of the 20th century, particularly since the 70s. But there have been other developments coming particularly from religious studies and early Christian studies, which were only beginning to take on, and these do complicate the picture. And perhaps the most important is the historicization of the concept of religion. This is associated with the work of Wilfred Cantrell Smith, of Talal Assad, and most recently Brent Nongbri. If we are to follow them in rejecting the idea that either early Christianity 
or Roman Judaism can properly be considered as religions, then phenomena like the worst of Mithras definitely can't be a religion. The ancient Mediterranean may have been a world full of gods, but following the, the work of these scholars, it certainly was also a world without religions. Now, the burden of Nongri's case, and I use him as a representative of the latest stage in which this debate has gone, is that it's impossible in ancient, ancient testimony to def, uh, identify any distinction that corresponds to Enlightenment or post-Enlightenment notions of a, of a sharp distinction between religious and secular. Religion didn't exist either as a separate province of the mind, nor as a social category that could be opposed to other orders. And this point is close to the argument others have advanced that we anachronistically reify religion when we take it, when we associate it with a particular social organization, a particular worldview, whether manifested in common rituals or common beliefs, or a combination of the two, let alone a social group whose members take part of their identity, individually or collectively, from their adherence to that group, to that idea. So if we accept this argument about Christianity and Judaism, then our fortiori must conclude there was no such thing as Mithraism, and there were no such people as Mithraists. Can we live with this? I can, I know. I'm going to try and persuade you that it's not a completely bad proposition. Scholars of Christianity are now agreed that early Christianity is a back formation, a projection into the past of, a, of something that was later created. Canon formation, the growth of first local and then global hierarchies of authority. In the Constantinian period, the creation of a, of a notion of a church which had its own history, the work of Eusebius and others. These are all components of the project. Daniel Boyara, and this is on the bibliography, has pointed to the parallel efforts of Christian heresiologists and the rabbis to establish boundaries for their particular groups to police the practice of their particular communities. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's no sign at all that this was ever conducted in relation to the worship of Mithras. And it's not really clear there was ever a community, real or imagined, that might have attempted a transformation like that. I think it's very difficult to show that those who engaged in the worship of Mithras underwent initiations and celebrated together had any common name for themselves or felt that this activity shaped or represented their, their identities. In fact, there are plenty of indications that many of those who worship Mithras worship lots of other gods as well. Nor do we know how faithful they were, how long they stayed engaged in the worship of Mithras as opposed to others. If we, if we firmly reject the notion of Mithraism as a proto-religion or as a rival to emergent Christianity, the final nail in the coffin of Kumar's theory, how are we going to understand the vast body of data that we've been spending today looking at concerning the worship of Mithras in the Roman world? Now, let me briefly summarise the nature of this data that most people in the room that I'm sure know it very well. I want to bring out some points about its distribution in space and time. And while I do it, I presented for you on the right hand side, the famous Malibu Mithras sitting up there in the Getty Museum. Um, I'm going to try and avoid traditional questions like where was Mithraism invented and by whom? How Persian was it really? What cosmological claims did it make? How did it pass away? I won't be able to avoid them completely, but I could at least try and keep them oblique to my argument. The data about Mithras in the West consists of four categories, images, inscriptions, buildings, and a small body of ancient testimony, least useful. So here are the categories of evidence. Now, our iconography is dominated by the scene of Mithras killing the bull, the Chiroptony, which we've seen many examples, and you're going to see a few in a minute. Hundreds of versions are known, each one slightly different, some much more elaborate than others. And so I'm going to move on from this slide now to take you through a few of them, although many are now very familiar um, from previous talks. Uh, all of them centre on the unbearded youth, usually caught in a moment of cutting the throat for a bull. Mostly, but not always, he's riding the bull. Often, but not always, his cloak billows out behind him. Often he looks out of the image to meet the viewer's eyes, but sometimes he looks back or up to the sun. Most of them feature the sun and the moon, portrayed in various ways. Many also give the god the two Frankie attendants with their torches, Katis and Katapanis. 
who like Mithras wear Persian cap and Persian trousers. That's to say, Persian, stereotypically Persian, as Nina pointed out. Below the rearing bull, there are usually or often images of a serpent, dog, and a scorpion who seem to assist in the gods. The place often seems that the sea often takes place between a kind of artificial arch. So you've got some more images here. And this arch usually is taken, I think, rightly to represent the cave mentioned in a few testimonia. Now, I've been constantly saying most, sometimes, often, because no two reliefs are ever identical. We're very, very far from having an absolutely orthodox presentation. The more of these tauroctonies you see, you keep seeing new details. Sometimes the very elaborate ones, like the one on the left you've got here, that from Nida, which has all sorts of other elements too, which could be interpreted astrological, a scenic, um, a narrative, probably a narrative. And then on the back of it, you've got the poor old bull after he's dead, being about to be butchered. Um, and then this rather nice replica from Frankfurt, they coloured it up for us. Um, so you can see some of these scenes. The point really, I suppose, is that, is that each Tauroctony is an individual creation, uh, recognised to be part of a family, but never, not a mechanical re reproduction. Now there are, of course, some mechanical reproductions. And if I move relatively rapidly through some of the variants, um, you'll get some sense of where the, uh, this, is the this is the one from, and here's the fresco we just saw already from Marino. And here you see, of course, some of these images are not cult images. We tend to think of the Tarotony most of all as a massive stone relief at one end of a small temple, but it's pretty clear that uh, there it features not only in frescoes, but also in freestanding altars, um, on brooches, in gems, on pottery. So these, this is mechanically reproduced in great numbers. And this shows one thing perhaps very clear is that Mithraic imagery was not de designated to be seen only by people who went to the temple and that it was recognisable. And this is a point that Gordon's made in relation to some of the allusions in early testimony. People knew, they may not know what it meant, but they recognised it. It was not a secret sign. So here's another vase from the zoo. Here's a freestanding altar showing him emerging from the rocks. Okay, let's move on to the temples then. The temples themselves are well known for central Italy for the northern provinces. They differ very large in detail, have common and unusual features. Unusual by classical terms, that is. First, the most unusual feature is their architectural decorations all on the inside. Um, most classical temples, you see a certain amount of ornamentation on the outside. So in some sense, it's an untemple. It's an upside down temple or world turned inside out. Um, some were actually underground, but many were not. It's very difficult to believe their locations were secret. Most Roman cities were extremely small. Most Roman camps, uh, likewise, a few thousand people. People must have known where it was. They must have recognised the image. So the secrecy is a kind of bogus secrecy. Where what most temples, in other words, present is a kind of facade of, of anonymity, where people know what's inside it. And they're very small. They can only accommodate a few dozen people. Now, finally, then, the final category of evidence of this rather beautiful um, gem turned into a seal ring, and there's the impression it makes. So if you want mechanical reproduction of identical images, you can get them. Here's the, here's the Temple of Mithras in London, recently reconstructed, well worth the visit. And a couple more famous instances, uh, two from Rome. And then yet another verse of this map we've seen a few times, where the Mithras temples are. Mithraeum, of course, is a modern term. By the end of the 20th century, there's a broad cons consensus that what's sometimes called Roman Mithraism, or the Roman cult of Mithras, was created in the first century CE. Uh, Merkelbach, um, ba Beck, Ulansi all argue there was a single genius inventor or uh, inventing group who bring together the complex of images um, and the rituals around them. But um, others point out the combination of actual Zoroastrian elements with orientalizing images of Persians with Greek titles. It's pretty clear that we're seeing bits of Persia, bits of Greece, bits of Rome all associated together. Roman Mithras becomes a product of bricolage, perhaps bricolage not unlike that, which created Hellenistic Isis or even Christianity. 
this explains nothing. I remember Jean Scheidt a long time ago saying, origins explain nothing. And since then, it's been often made the point that simply because somebody invents some complex hybrid, that doesn't really help. You need to know why it takes on a why it's different. And testimony doesn't help very much either. Um, the name Mitra appears, as others have shown, in many historical texts from the 5th century BC onwards. References to the domestic cult begin at the end of the 1st century CE. Gordon's ideas on Persianism have already been mentioned. Um, later sources are fuller, always worrying when the later you get, the more people know about something. Um, at least some Christian sources um, show an anxiety about superficial similarity between Mithras and Christ. Neoplatonists make their own appropriation of Mithras. One thing that does seem clear is that nobody who writes about Mithras claims to know about him as by virtue of having worshipped him. We have no, no testimony that represents itself as an insider account. Now, of course, some of them may have known about it, but this is very different from Christian apol apologia, where you get people like Firmicius and Maternus who, who know about what it's like to be a pagan because they were pagans. So none of our testimony presents itself as the secret inside story. Bricolage and syncretism along with various modes of translation, visual and textual, are actually central to Mediterranean religiosity. Nor is this specific to the religious sphere. Hybridity is common to the material culture of all of the ancient Mediterranean throughout antiquity. The difficult bit is not explaining how things came to be hybridized, it's explaining why some hybrids succeed and not others. This has even given rise to, the, to an epidemiological theory of, of religion, where what you have to do is to look at why a particular hybrid exploits the vulnerabilities of potential host populations rather than, um, rather than others. Now, one of the advantages of Kumon's ideas was it provided an answer to this question, why Mithras? Mithraism, as he conceived as a religion, might be supposed to police its boundaries in the same way other ancient religions at the time were believed to have done. You might imagine a hierarchy of patres who organized the dissemination of the cult, sent out Mithraic apostles to found communities, um, set limits on the variability of the key images, got rid of tarotonies that were off message, dealt with disobedient and deviant Mithraists, um, got rid of people who didn't understand the astrological import of this, um, this sort of fantasy still recurs today. A few years ago, I took part in a radio program at Mithras, and almost as soon as we went off the air, I was contacted by somebody who said, I am a Freemason of long standing, and what you describe is exactly the same as Freemasonry. <laughs> now, the trouble is, of course, there's no evidence for any of this policing or control or editing. We don't know of any Mithraic Paul writing anxious letters from Rome to Nedenheim, or Edenheim, or Edenheim to Rome, or to Syria, trying to round people up, saying, no, no women, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow or other, we've got, we're trying to understand a dissemination that seems to have no management from above. And not only is there no evidence for management, there are strong reasons not to believe in management from above, because there is no management from above in the case of early Christian movements, and there is no management from above in the case of diaspora Judaism. There is nothing in the ancient world that does the kind of job which we, which we would need to assume if we want to think of Mithraism as a movement that's organized. There are no schismatic or heretic Mithraists to appear in the testimonia. We know of nobody who claimed to be a Mithraist. Some individuals invested some money and a good deal of time in the worship of Mithras, perhaps in those places where, and many think this, it was rare, people went through a series of initiatory graves, perhaps they stayed involved a little bit longer. But who's to say that those most involved in the cult of Mithras might not also have been those most involved in the other, in worse for other gods? As was certainly the case in the fourth century, characters like Vectus Agorius, Praetus Status, and Paulina, who's, who are not specifically Mithraeus, but they are interested in all of that sphere. In other words, we don't really know that these four, the, those who worship Mithras formed in any sense a different kind of population. Much of the, many of the reliefs that survive, the excavated temples that they're often found in, and the associated epigraphy, was actually created in a relatively short period. 
it begins in the first in the second beginning of the second century, just possibly the end of the first century CE, and it continues into the early third century. So the period in which most of the evidence I've been presenting to you is generated, except for the testimonia, is 100 to 150 years. It's a relatively short-lived period of production. This is an interesting period for other reasons. It's also the period in which Christians are first noticed by non-Christians, which you first begin to get references in Pliny, Suetonius, and so on as Christians. It's also a period following the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, in which synagogues and rabbis come to be the leading foci of activity within the diaspora community. Work by Boyarin and Schwartz up here on the screen and others has mapped how fundamentally these developments respond to the imperial context, Roman Imperial and Persian Imperial. Neither Christians nor Jews have much in the way of super local organization. Instead, in different ways, local leaders make connections one to another and try to establish common lines. Boyarin that memorably compares the work of heresiologists like Justin and Irenaeus to the work of the rabbis, each quite separate and not in touch with each other, trying to organize and police and install some kind of uniformity. Recent work on the Roman Empire has introduced the idea of globalization. Now, while there are certainly some resemblances between the effects of global capitalism and the operations of a world empire, connections, circulation, centralization, it's also become very clear not only that ancient globalization was very, very weak compared to modern, but the forces leading to local fragmentation are very powerful. The Roman world defaults to the local. This is true in every industry you look at, from wall painting to pottery production to the design of statuettes and so on to the names of gods. The forces that the rabbis and the Christian leaders are trying to counteract the forces that lead to local fragmentation are enormously strong. So we can ask, what holds the worship of Mithras together? I couldn't resist this picture either, really. It's it quite true, yeah. just so lovely, isn't it? <laughs> I want to conclude then by suggesting that rather than think of a movement, we think about moments of coherence and moments of and periods of lack of coherence. With the lack of coherence, the divergence being the norm. My argument then is the worship of Mithras didn't survive as any kind of unified entity. Late antique Judaisms and Christianities displayed markedly local features, despite the great efforts and resources put into trying to make them all the same. Both aspired some kind of unity to maintain an imagined community despite the tyranny of distance. We've no idea whether Mithraic Pates wanted to do anything like the same. Now, one reason I surveyed the evidential basis for Mithras worship at the beginning was to illustrate how scattered it is geographically, how many gaps remain. This is true, of course, of many aspects of ancient culture. And we have basically, we have two tactics for dealing with it, which archaeologists call lumping and splitting. So lumping is where you bring bits of scattered data from different sources, different kinds, and different periods, and different places together. And you try and make them all fit together into one model. So here's an example of this. We have a mosaic from the second century Mithraeum of Felicissimus that we saw earlier. And we have a letter from a fourth century Christian uh, to Lyta. And by combining the signs on the pavement with what Jerome says in the emboldened bit at the bottom, you end up with an idea that Mithraeus always had seven grades and they corresponded to these seven types and these seven symbols, and then, if you like, seven planetary deities and so on. The trouble with this tactic is it depends on a presumption of uniformity. You wouldn't dream of lumping unless you thought it was all the same anyway. And what I'm trying to argue is that we can't begin with the assumption of uniformity. In fact, the opposite is much more likely. Now, the alternative is to look at the differences and exploit them, splitting. Um, most important recently is the work of David Walsh on late antique Mithras worship. Walsh finds that 4th century sites, 4th century temple sites, are much more diverse than their 2nd century counterparts. There are also fewer of them. You can set his conclusions alongside the work of Martens at the Temple of Mithras, discovered in the Vigas of Tiernum in Belgium, where in a completely non-standard way. They have a temple built out of timber next to a large pre-existing cult structure and 
apparently hundreds of people engage in great feasts which are not restricted to a tiny segment of the population. The site and structure are quite different to what we think was the archetypal spelium. The small finds of fauna remains suggest this feast involved all sorts of animals, some strange, some very boring like chickens. Here then, at the northern extremities of empire, the worship of Mithras is quite different to what the lumpers would lead us to suppose. Now much of the discussion around testimony about Mithras worship since Kumor revolved in trying to work out which bits of evidence are really Mithraic and which are not. So I suggest that Kumov and Mazaran and their successors have also engaged in a process of boundary keeping, doing the work that wasn't done by Mithraic rabbis or Mithraic apostles. That the, trying to organize things so that Mithra, Mithraism looks more coherent involves doing things like ejecting the Mithras liturgy, um, part of the great magical papyrus of Paris. We've got a picture of it here. Um, a few people think it's a, a precious glimpse into the thought world of Mithraists, but most people think it's an appropriation of Mithraic ideas in some new syncretic project, perhaps by people who didn't really understand what Mithraism was about. These suppositions, of course, depend on the idea that there was a Mithraism, that it was about something, that there was something there to understand. And that, I suggest, isn't a safe presumption to make. Another case is Sol Invictus. A great deal of work has gone to separate out Sol Invictus from Deus Invictus. Deus Invictus being a name for Mithras. Both of them are clearly close in stage with the sun. Both have the title Invictus, but Sol Invictus um, is a deity um, looked at, that is patronized by, particularly popularized by the Emperor Aurelian. And a great deal of effort was made by others to say, well, this, they're, this, they're quite separate, really. What if they're not? What if this is really just a sign of more fragmentation and incoherence? My suggested other words is we make more use, we would make more, we would make more sense of this body of data if we don't begin from the presumption, which now seems quite unlikely, that there was a Mithraic religion that appeared at a point in time, flourished, and then was extinguished, perhaps by force in the fifth century. Instead of this, I suggest we look for patterns of coherence and moments of divergence. The striking similarity of second century imagery, I suggest, is most is best explained by rapid expansion. Very rapid expansion without much chance for diversification. But as soon as that expansion has, has happened, the local communities begin to diverge, begin to do quite different things. Sometimes we find Mithras cohabiting with other gods, with Jupiter, Dolichanus, um, or um, even with gods like the, the, the serpent fighting giants of the Jupiter columns in the northwest. There may be a period in which things are kept together a bit better by the circulation of troops. But pretty soon, divergence has happened. Some would have taken the form of new hybridizations. If David Walsh is correct, Mithras in many areas just fades off into the background, gets dissolved back into the polytheistic background noise. That moment of coherence around that first hybridization disappears as he becomes yet another god to be mingled with Helios and Apollo and all the others. Magicians, makers of ambulance, Neoplatonic philosophers, had, they found other affordances in the imagery of Mithras, but that doesn't mean they understood or perpetuated Mithraic religion. Now this pattern of change, of cultural change, I suggest, isn't unique to Mithras, nor is it particularly unique to religion. It's true of terra sigillata, it's true of the design of, of stamp, of, 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 um, of, of lamps. Localization is the default trend in the Roman world. This makes it all the more remarkable, I suspect, that Mithras remained as distinctive as he did for the short period in which he did remain distinctive. Thank you. Everybody who is working with on Mitra is is going through uh, at the moment the difference between 
um, local, uh, global and, uh, and local and, yes. uh, and, uh, and, and need to. Um, and I think to a very large extent, I, I, I agree. Um, but I am also a bit hesitant uh, as for uh, this denunciation of religion uh, that is so fashionable at the moment. I have to say I completely agree that we shouldn't project our definition of religion on antiquity, mm -hmm. but to abolish the notion altogether only because it's another way of dealing with religion. I mean, it's still humans um, having relations with uh, unseen beings and in my view that's sort of essential for religion so maybe you know just to be it, it's it's all a kind of definition so but i do I, I, and i would like to have something to uh, uh from the unity to sort of stand uh and not sort of demolish everything because that is really uh, um i mean it is after all remarkable that for a code without a center, without an authority, uh, without probably uh, uh, a written fixed story, we find these monuments spread out around the world that are so much alike. I mean, this, that is amazing. And, and I, I, I completely agree that there is a great deal of creativity, that people are really, really free. But it is quite amazing that the moment you see it, you know what it is. I'll never forget that my friend, first, he had seen Huat before we knew Huat. He made a drawing of a part of the painting, and it was the tail of the bull, and I immediately knew it was a Mithraeum. I mean, and that must have been something that was also socially important in this world. I mean, we have a Roman world, it is connected, and, and people go from A to B to, and they probably recognized it and, and could relate to it. Everybody was doing his own thing with it, but there, there must have been a kernel, at least a kernel of something that was going on. That's not complete. And it's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm against the Gordon who says that it's all creativity of the Papists and they can do it every day like. That's just as bad as, as Kumon was doing. Because, you know, it's also one size fits all. Yes, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to back up the Mr. Go Guide thesis of, 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 of no, Gordon. No, no, yeah. I know, I know. You don't I mean, know. a national religion, I mean I, I mean, I accept that cosmological beliefs, magical action, ritual have been part of the human experience since as long as we've been human, 40,000 years, maybe yeah. further. So, uh, but that's not quite the same as religions as sort of entities. And, no, of course, and that, that seems to be the distinction that that I, I think, were, I mean, I've, of course, this is religious. And of course, it's connected with ritual and cosmology, but it's, it doesn't, I think, correspond to that kind of bounded entity which emerges much later, nor does it correspond to something which is separate from the secular world. And I think unless one would have to rethink Christianity and Judaism as well to be able to return to the idea that this is a religion. As for, as for coherence, I, mean, I think this is, I mean, this is a question that it's almost an art historical question rather than a, than a social question. There are periods where style is very similar and periods where it breaks up and Lots of archaeological moments where that happened, and linear band ceramic material culture is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Later Neolithic ones are fantastically divergent, and so the problem seems to me: how do we how do we understand the movement towards convergence and then away from convergence? No, but also socially speaking, things were happening inside these rooms, and I think that ritually speaking, there happened something happened there that was really strong. And it must have been, I think, bonding. And I mean, the people called the Sundexios. I mean, they were they were giving themselves a name. They were feeling themselves a group. What I do think is that this didn't count anymore once they stepped out. So I think it's exactly the opposite. I think there was a difference between the world outside and the world inside. And it, 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 what the difference is that 
religion as we know it, or Christianity, Islam, whatever, it's determining our lives. This was not the case in antiquity. But once you were inside, you were dealing with it, you were, you were part of the system, and that was very real, I think. Okay. That's sort of my... But, um, yeah. I'm just conscious of, of time, oh, sure, yeah. but I do want to check. There seems to have been an additional pop up in the chat, and I don't want to forget about our friends online. So we'll just see if this is a question. Oh, no, just saying thank you for a wonderful day. <laughs> yeah, I think those are all people saying that um, there's a mute issue. Yeah, that was old. All right, um, so of course we can continue having conversations over dinner. I just did want to have one last uh, kind of conclusion address. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just want to point out, if you read the program, um, my concluding remarks don't begin at 4.30 a.m., <laughs> which is a beautiful old, uh, scenario. Okay, so um, for any of, you know, some of this has a little a little bit of roughness. These are my concluding remarks that I've put together in the course of the of the conference today. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the presenters and panel chairs, many of whom have come from afar to contribute. So in this conclusion, I aim to connect together some of the major themes um, in this conference and offer some observations on possible ways forward. I do this against the backdrop of a selection of visual and archaeological material to give us a look at but also to hopefully um, to reframe or ask some new questions on some familiar uh, objects, sites. So our meeting follows uh, from a fluorescence of scholarship in the last decade on Mithra and Mithraism, some of which, like Adrich uh, et al. and Lahe on the left, have explored the problem through a broader comparative uh, approach. So where do we find Mithra? While the compilation is late antique, the Avesta, along with the Rig Veda, reflects her oldest stratum of evidence. Though, however, this was not a dry, static literary tradition. And we saw this today in Shervin Karinajad's talk. Shervin's contribution grounds the Avestan hymns in a concrete context of the Zoroastrian ritual. This context is very important because it sheds light um, on the ancient and a contemporary Zoroastrian experience, where Mithra was vitally present as a protector in the microcosm of the ritual, in the body of the priest, in the fire temple, in the liturgical calendar, as well as homes of the laity, as well as the landscape, and in the changes of the season. Again, Mithra was and is a central part of the lived reality of the devout Zoroastrianism. So, Mithra is mentioned in later Old Persian royal inscriptions, which are our first solid archaeologically datable attestation. But the god is not portrayed visually in the Achaemenid period. In Artaxerxes II inscription, Mithra along with Anahita are mentioned after Ur Mazda, which reflects an innovation in Achaemenid official religion, and perhaps a reintroduction of the more popular religious tradition into official discourse. Other than these inscriptions, we have no archaeological evidence of Mithra or Mithra worship in the Achaemenid period, or only the Achaemenid era onomasticon and later Roman period texts. Indeed, however, the god is prevalent in the post achaemenid Iranian religions of the Caucasus and Anatolia, including Kalmagenic, but also Armenia, which combined with fragmentary evidence. 
it's just that Mithra was prominent in part in Zoroastrianism, though the evidence that got there is extremely scant. It's only after Alexander the Great that Mithra develops a recognizable iconography in Persian Iranian visual cultures. And the earliest portrayals, as discussed today by Florence Grenet, of the god uh, derived from Greek iconography. Only one iconographic attribute appears in multiple regions and persists through multiple different time periods. The most consistent attribute in Iranian lands are the solar rays or radiate nimbus framing the head, adopting aspects of Helios and Apollo. This is attested both visually and textually from South Asia to Kushan coinage to Armenia and Anatolia and beyond. And here we're grateful for the work of Franz Grenet as well as Michael Shankar, whose scholarship has greatly clarified understanding of this fragmentary archive. And a number of Greco Bactrian Indo Greek coins carry images of radiant deities on their obverse. While some appear to be Apollo or Helios, in others, the attribute appears in unexpected places, like on Zeus. Most of these, um, most of these is ambiguous whether these deities are indeed Mithra, and this was likely the point, which makes our task as interpreters more challenging and interesting. These are multivalent images uh, by design. This deliberate cultural promiscuity, visual cultural promiscuity, is present in the first unquestionably clear image of Mithra, and it occurs in many of the later manifestations. It appears in Kalagenin in the reliefs associated with Antiochus the first new state religion, where he appears in both Persian clothing and Hellenic nudity. The cult reform took place sometime after the submission of Tigran II, 69 BC. The god referred to is Apollo with Mithra's Hermes, with some variations in that, as listed among the chief deities of his constructed and deliberately culturally complex pantheon, which also speaks to an earlier tradition of Armenian dynastic sanctuaries. Despite the popularity of Athenian and royal names under the assassins, no clear images survive in the assassin era, though the radiant figure, figure in relief from the highlands of Khuzestan and taken from the Sarbok may reference the god, though here too that cultural promiscuity is also present. This may also refer to a Semitic sun god. Um, in the Eastern Iranian world, first unambiguously clear images of the god appear several decades later on the Kushan coins of Kanishka. The god also appears on a Buddhist relic art with Ma, that is the moon god, flanking Kanishka properly diadem. Tantalizingly, Mir is listed in the deities of the Kushan dynastic sanctuary, Ravatak, in a sense paralleling, and here in the sense of parallel but not necessarily leading or diverging, paralleling the Anatolian Armenian tradition. This is also, and we can move in order, this is the same time the other great mythraic phenomenon explodes with popularity. This is, of course, one of the problems dealt with in our conference. Uh, and as for earlier studies, greatly problematized the phenomena. Sometime in the early Roman Empire, and here we can't speak with any exactitude, the god became the chief feature of one of the more successful religions in the Roman Empire. As we've heard, by others who command greater expertise in the topic. There is no consensus on the central myth of the Mithraic cult, and despite decades of study, we almost we scarcely understand the meaning of the central images, despite their ubiquity. Attilio Master Cinque's theory that was promoted as a means to cement devotion to Augustus's imperial revolution is ingenious, but unsupported by the direct evidence. Nevertheless, as we saw today, Mithraism was very much aligned with the expansion of the Roman army, and Adura, as elsewhere in the Limes, was lost from the provinces to vault to the local, as Greg Wolf said, when those aspects of the empire retreated or were lost as well. Aslamiano uh, Dayton brought our focus to Roman Mithraism during a time when the religion projected itself more and more into the public sphere, in the third century under Aurelian. It experiences significant transformations due to a dynamic social content. <coughs> he also called attention to the social dynamics of the Mithraea after the loss of their protected status with the coming of Christianity, with archaeological attested destructions and closures. Lucinda Durbin brought attention to the ways in which the Dura Mithraea and the Dura community provides a case study in how these communities actively reached out competitively to neighboring religions and communities through iconographies and compositions. 
The Durham Mithraeum and its adherents competitively engaged with other communities like the Jewish community and paintings in uh, the synagogue. The Roman context is incredibly important. Thus, Nina Majdu put our focus on how Persianisms contribute to the construction of religion. That is, uh, the perspective of Greco of Greco Roman understandings of Persia and its legacy. So, in this regard, stemming from Greg, Greg Wolf's paper, I would like to annoyingly ask the question that he said he did not want to ask <laughs> How Persian was Roman Mithras, and to whom? To his adherents? Did it matter to them that it had no similarity to Mazdian rituals? In this comparative event, I think the same question could be put to one of the other widely popular deities who has a similar spread throughout the same geographic sphere during this period of and beyond, that is, Jesus. The adherents of East Syriac and Monothecite Christianity would have found great differences despite similarities, and even more so Gnostic and later Manichaean and even Muslim Jesuses. Some of these were competing interpretations, others of Manichaeism, as the example par excellence, was a direct competitive, even parasitic appropriation. Religion or Mithra uh, also appears as well as Manichaeism. With inspiration also from Greg's talk, I think it's important to consider that people who frequented Mithraea were active participants in other religious communities as well. For a moment, they can inhabit or even try on a Persian identity when they're in the Mithraean. I would wonder if secret societies such as the Masons, or even the Shriners, or even the Boy Scouts, which are similarly purported to be based in Eastern or indigenous knowledge, might provide an illuminating, in, in sort of half baked anachronistic uh, comparison. In Western Iran, that is Persia proper, forget the slide. The first image of Mithra appears in a nimbate figure on the coin of Urmas I, uh, 272 to 273, and is reflected with inscriptions in certain issues of the Sasanian rulers of the former Kushan and North territories. Here, another competitive statement. It's possible that these might have been a aggressive or a triumphalist statement directed at the now defeated Kushans. As was discussed with different interpretations, a radiant figure holding a barsum has been identified with Mithra, appearing in the Sasanian rock relief of Taki Bustani. I would add that to the common viewer, uh, despite the various different interpretations uh, that have been put forward, there would have been considerable iconographic slippage between deities and kings. And this site, that is Taki Bustani, was one that was subject to multiple artistic and inscriptional reinterpretation of the succeeding reigns something that Ardashir II would no doubt take advantage of, even should we accept the figure in the center uh, to be Shakur II. While he is subordinate to the wise lord Ormazd in the main textual tradition of Sasanian and post sasanian Sarashkism, as preserved in the medieval Middle Persian path of the books, onomastics suggest that he remained popular throughout the Sasanian Empire, and of course, in the Eastern Iranian world of Central Asia. Here, two uh, one of our uh, contributions brought our attention to its popularity and wide vitality of Mithra in Persia. Uh, Carlo Ceretti brought us a new look at the problem of onomastics that speak, names that have meaning. He points out that these names do not find precise parallels in any Avesti uh, text. However, some of them may reflect epithets or phrases attested in the Yasht, and some of them even find correspondences with imperial discourse. For example, Artaxerxes II, uh, his inscription. While very challenging to deal with, they point to the ubiquity of Mithra and the fluid movement between ritual, political, and popular discourse, and religious and personal identities. These official images are complemented at several moments by additional images that derive from either textual descriptions of the god and adapted to uh, by new textual, by new sources. We see a great deal of variety with multiple new newly invented images for multiple communities. Some of these appear to respond to a stable oral textual canon, most notably epithets or descriptions that we know from certain domestic texts, but which circulated also in vernaculars. Images of Mithra emerging from the mountain or rocks are the most salient example, and they appear on scattered seals. Others were appropriated from Greek iconographies, but at this point, for example, in this uh, 
the same seal, uh, thoroughly assimilated. Franz Grenet's magisterial overview provided a view into the ubiquity of Mithra in Eastern Iran. His iconography cloaks that of the other solar deity, solar deity portrayed as a charioteer over the 38 meter tall Buddha at Bamiyan and on the conference poster, uh, and also graces other places in the Bamiyan Valley, which had been particularly associated with Mithra in the investment tradition. This iconography appears to have impacted the earlier developments of the iconography of Surya, and this and other iconographies of Mithra appear further east in murals of Kucha and Dunhuang in the service of Buddhism, as well as the Sogdian funerary couch in China. <coughs> Moreover, I would like to call attention to the way this evidence also illustrates the role Mithra played in interreligious competition. The ultimate context for the Bamiyan mural is, of course, as an attribute of the colossal Buddha statue. Mithra here was important enough that he was drafted into the service of this colossal statement of Buddhist religious triumphalism, moving it deeply into the valley. One here can also point out to this later spread in Buddhist iconography in China. So to wrap this up, I finally turn to a broader methodological problem. And I do so by offering perhaps offering some questions and I hope uh, some possible ways forward. To what extent are these various Afro-Eurasian manifestations of Mithra comparable? Is it worthwhile comparing the incomparable in the words of Marcel de Tandy, and studying these long distance and cross temporal manifestations of the deity. If we decide to, what are we looking for? What level and type of similarity are we searching for? And what is the ultimate point? A common linguistic root for the name of the god? If we are not searching for or arguing that there was any doctrinal or ritual similarity across the Roman Iranian divide, what can this sort of comparative project potentially uh, contribute? I would argue that it is worth investigating the moments when the ancients also recognized or created similarities. And one of the constant themes that I see throughout this evidence in the conference is that of competition, both political and interreligious. Perhaps instead of approaching Mithra in Iran or China as a single linear development with this center and diffusionary process, I would offer that it makes more sense to see it as a dynamic assemblage. I prefer this term versus hybrid or homage. And here I follow my Lord uh, Dr. Bach or Bruce Lincoln's admonition uh, referred to syncretism, which all presuppose origin or purity. So, assemblage thoughts, um, to those who aren't uh, familiar with it, draws from the work of uh, Deleuze and Guattari, and scholars such as Manuel Landa attempt to systematize. It, and related uh, is also the work of uh, Bruno Latour and others. It holds a relational view of social re reality in which human action results from shifting interdependencies between material, narrative, social, and spatial or geographic elements. The theories also have in common an account for emergent qualities that result from associations between humans and non humans. In other words, an assemblage approach, this assemblage approach asserts that within a body, or society, relationships of component parts are not stable and fixed. And I think we saw that uh, very much today, in, in, uh, for example, Roman and Branson. Rather, they can be displaced and replaced within and among other bodies, thus approaching systems in relation to the exterior. In a process of becoming, one piece of the assemblage is drawn into the territory of another, changing its value as an element of bringing new unity. This was particularly illustrated in Lucinda Gerben's talk. An oft-used example of this principle is the way in which, of course, uh, atoms are drawn into an assemblage, but this process is also uh, seen in the image in the figure of Mithra. At Jura, one can speak of popular local fashions and compositions, such as Parthian dress and hunting scenes, uh, being drawn into this new assemblage. This analytical stance allows us to take seriously these more tenuous connections and correspondences across Eurasia without demanding a stable uh, and common genetic origin or linear developmental connection. There's different times, different moments in time where they bounce together and come into contact. Uh, there's points where there's uh, a great deal of persistence uh, through time, uh, and perhaps a static nature that then is broken apart with a whole new uh, political or you know, geopolitical uh, 
dynamic. It allows us to encompass a range of religious phenomena from state institutions, personal devotions, competitive appropriations, art, architectural, and ephemeral acts. So how does this relate to our conference today? To begin with, we have first approached Mithra in this conference as an assemblage constructed by scholarship. So this is the historiography of Mithra and Mithraism. In fact, it's vital to approach it this way in order to not fall in the trap into which earlier generations have fallen. That is, assuming that similarities necessarily point to a result from a similar stable entity or concept or system. It also complicates the efforts of ancient and modern boundary keepers, as Greg put it. Secondly, and here I think this is the most fruitful, uh, should one attempt to approach it as a comparative project. There are moments in the ancient world when Mithra was assembled in new and different ways for specific purposes, either deliberately or dynamically. Here, what is salutary is that this frees us from expecting or searching for a long stable history. In contrast to early approaches, it is especially important to focus on the force of political will and manifesting the contested uh, Mithra in some of those major fixed points, like in the Kushan Empire or the Kamageni, uh, as well as in Bamiya. Uh, these were rhetorical in a way, political and competitive images. If even an aspect of Attilio Master Cinque's theory that Mithraism was a creation of the imperial cult, Roman Mithras can be viewed this way as well. Even if we do not understand the exact meaning of the cult, as has been argued, nor do the ancient adherents, it is still nonetheless uh, function as a dynamic assemblage. Finally, uh, and this is what I'll close with, in addition to a move away from constructing methodologies focused on fixed systems, this more open-ended approach opens up interpretive space for making sense of unstable shifting sets of relationships, including other than human actors, that nonetheless made a real impact on the world. The actors in these sets of relationships are not just humans from this point of view, but also images, objects, and spaces from Mithraea in the Roman West to the very Bamiyan Valley in the uh, Eastern Rock world. In fact, a great deal of what was significant to ancient actors as well as modern interpreters was not text, but performances, sites, landscapes, objects, images. Thank you.